folks. Welcome back to Indaba Hacker. This is Chris once again. Hello, folks, and welcome back to the program. Yeah, you're in the right place. This is the right place. It's once again time for Answer the Question with Rob Hutchison and Chris Wyatt. Rob, answer the question. How you doing? Oh, I'm quite well, thank you. All right, now that we've got that out of the way, the tough questions are out of the way. <laughs> let me let me ask you this question. So, so let me ask this question. So uh, uh, who is Mike Epps? Sir, I can't answer that question. Were there federal agents at the January 6th event in D.C.? Sir, I can't answer that question. Did the FBI attempt to incite the crowd in Washington, D.C.? I can't answer that question. What question can you answer? My name is none of your business. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm sure that uh, you might know that reference. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz grilled a member of the Department of Injustice. That's what I'm calling ours now. It's also the Department of Injustice, not just South Africa. We also share that. Ronnie Lamola, uh, Lamola has good company here with Merrick Garland on this side of the Atlantic. So, uh, Rob, it's been yet another exciting week in South Africa as we discover the mastermind behind, once again, the parliamentary fire, this genius. You know, I saw News 24 where... They ran eight things you need to know about Zandile Mafe, and they run through the list. And number three is that he wasn't homeless. That's not true. That's fake news. He wasn't homeless. That's what they said. So I continue to read it. And number eight says, uh, residents say that he left Kesh at uh, uh, Cape Flats uh, about 10 days ago and was living on the streets outside of the cathedral. That's not homeless? Oh, is it? It's a temporary accommodation, apparently. He sleeps on the streets. So in the same article in which they mislead and lie to you, they tell the truth. And that's what this, the media is doing these days. They lie to you with the clickbait headlines or the crux, the main part where people read the first two paragraphs. And then you get further down and they actually reveal the truth. I guess that way they cover their behinds going, well, no, we reported the facts. Yeah. Anyway. Do, does the media ever report facts anymore? Or is it just simply opinion and interpretation? Or do they just copy and paste media releases that are sent to them by by authorities and by civil society organizations and by individuals with uh, vested interests. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think there's any such thing as a, a real, real journalistic approach or outlet anymore at all, Chris. They really don't. I think you're right, Rob. It's 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 really it's hard to find. You know, here for a while in the states, I came back uh, to the states. By the way, folks, uh, Rob's mic was off. That was intentional. We didn't want you to hear from him. It's on now. That last name you heard. <laughs> so so I'll I'll be sure to send Rob one billion Zimbabwean dollars in compensation for his uh, his discomfort there. But not, my apologies, Rob. Your mic was 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 shut down. The desktop audio wasn't turned on uh, for when we greeted each other. So anyway, but uh, I think people got, I think people got the gist of it. But uh, yeah, no, I agree with you. You know, it's years ago. I was overseas in, uh, I think it was in Africa, or maybe it was in Europe, I'm not sure, but an assignment overseas. And uh, Fox News uh, had not been on the American Forces Network, which used to be called the Armed Forces Network, but we can't sound militaristic, so it's the American Forces Network now, which is a global radio and telecommunication system with satellites and, and local stations and towers all around the world to provide military information services for our troops around the world. Anyway, and ships at sea. So I was, uh, they finally brought Fox News on, and I watched it because it had this, this, this tagline, fair and balanced. And I watch it, and I'm like, what's the brouhaha about? I mean, other than the opinion shows, th this is, mind you, 17 years ago. Other than the opinion shows, I mean, it is it is news. I mean, I see Brett Barry, he's actually reporting the news. He's not telling you, well, this is what's really going on. He's reporting the news. Uh, and then I watched uh, the opinion shows with uh, the Riley Factor and uh, Sean Hannity, who I can only take for small bites, you know, otherwise I get a little nauseated. But <laughs> but uh, but there were opinion shows. I knew what I was watching, you know, but it wasn't a whole network. But over time, even Fox News slid away from that anchor of reporting news and virtually every program on the network when I stopped watching it about two years ago was really just an opinion show even what's supposed to be a hard-hitting news report is simply an opinion disguised as news it's 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 sad now and people say it's about money it's not about money because networks that do this on the left side of the aisle in the U.S. and in Europe are losing money. They're only being propped up by big, deep pocket people who eventually will get tired of carrying them I mean MSNBC has fewer viewers than I had on my old channel <laughs> Salty Cracker has twice as many viewers as MSNBC's top-rated program, and a guy is you know is a a, a profanity spewing, hilarious you know attacking the left sort of semi pseudo comedian there in California. <laughs> <laughs> pseudo comedian Let, let's just say not a comedian but yeah it's it is a sad state of affairs if, if you really look at it and it's it, it's it's reflected in in the viewership and I saw some articles recently about Joe Joe Rogan. Um, on the alternative media side and, and streaming service 
gets an average of 11 million views per show. And ne next up, I think, was uh, Hannity, funny enough, with um, 4 million. And that's, was that's it Hannity or Tucker got. Carlson? Probably Tucker Carlson. Tuck, Tucker Carlson. Yeah, Tucker Carlson. Right. Yeah, Tucker yeah. Carlson. Tucker Carlson. Hannity was fur further down. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, from 11 million, and the next place is 4 million. You, you've got to uh, stop and question why. There, there's something going on there. Is it, is it the, a giant wake up in, in civil society? Is it a giant wake up in, in the public at large who have realized that there's no real news out there anymore? It's always propaganda. It's always a hidden agenda, and they're all the same. Mm. You see a script going from one channel to the next channel, from one show to the next, and it's 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 really it's pathetic, and it's not worth it's not worth even tuning in anymore, as far as I'm concerned. I'd rather get my my news from Twitter. It seems to be far more realistic there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's something to be said for that. You know, I, the only reason I kept the Twitter account is because of breaking news and video footage of people who are on the scene for places providing that sort of thing. As long as I don't get fraudulent copyright claims from so-called South African YouTubers who attack other YouTubers covering South Africa. We won't mention that name, Odez. Anyway, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, <laughs> that, one's, that one's about to expire in eight days, that fraudulent copyright claim. Anyway, we'll see what happens. But um, yeah, no, it's uh, I'm with you on that. The only reason I kept Twitter is because it really is a cancer. I mean, you can't get in a cogent conversation with people on there. Either everyone believes everything you say or they hate you and don't believe a word you say. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about crocheting and knitting or you're talking about, you know, the KZN insurrection, you know, it doesn't matter. You'll get attacked. So to me, the cancer yeah. that is Twitter is useful for what you talk about. I can get there and somebody like the, the you just had the fires there um, in Kleinmund and people, not many videos, but like the Cape Town fires, I got a lot of my footage from Twitter and I credited, of course, the people who provided the footage, but it is good for breaking news stories from that standpoint, but I wouldn't use Twitter for analysis. I, I, I use it no. to make my own decisions, <laughs> to make my own decisions. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. It's a good starting point, and it's a good, it's a good medium to get um, a, 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 an idea of the public opinion and what people actually think and how they react to certain to certain news. But no, definitely not for for analysis, analysis and so on. Where do we get our information from, Chris? Where can we possibly get reliable information from? Well, that's tough. You've, you've, you've got to find uh, who you trust and you believe in. You know, it's uh, for my program, a lot of people believe what I say implicitly, and I, and I caution them about that. Hey, look, we all make mistakes. We all get misled at times. And uh, I will stand by my analysis. My analysis is never bankrupt. That doesn't mean I don't get it wrong sometimes. It is rare. But but I do tell people that, listen, uh, when you watch my news program, don't just take it from me. Follow up. Go look for the information. Read it on your own. And you might reach a different conclusion or you might think that I, I, I interpreted it incorrectly. And that's your prerogative. But, you know, you really need to look around. And now, you, there's two things I'd like to mention about what you were just discussing. The first is about... Um, about uh, Joe Rogan getting 11 million viewers. Now, people are all excited about that, because. Uh, but the thing is that Rush Limbaugh had an audience of 35 to 40 million every single day for 30 years plus on radio. That's true. That is an incredible audience, and that's nationwide, all across America. And actually, it's global because his program, uh, bits of it would show up on the uh, overseas and things. So, yeah, but it was, it was the mostly an American audience and Canadian audience, and that's unbelievable. Every single day. So, I mean, people are impressed by Joe Rogan's 11 million. I'm impressed. I, I, I've got a little bit of envy there. I'd like a little tiny slice of that audience, but <laughs> yeah, just throw, toss me 200,000 there, Joe. That's fine with me. But uh, but the point is, it, <laughs> is that, uh, so that's the first point. Second thing is that, you know, the, the, the hate wanking Australian who sent me nasty emails, uh, once again, because I keep calling Australia a penal colony, I, you know. So anyway, I mean, it's, I'm sorry. Did it start out as a, as a holiday resort? No, it was a penal colony and it's returned to its roots. But anyway, seriously, <laughs> it's returned. You know, it's nostalgia. They were nostalgic for the old days. They're going to pull out the whips and start whipping people for not being vaccinated. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, seriously, the second point was that he's like, oh, yeah, who do you, you, you have, you have 5,000 subscribers. You're a nobody. I'm like, um, you know, the conscious character, Ernst von Sell, has incredible content, and, and he does a great job. Mm -hmm. He's objective. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, his audience was two or 3,000 people. That didn't mean that he wasn't amazing. That didn't mean he was a, not a very intelligent and thoughtful young man who got it right. It just meant that people weren't exposed to him. Or maybe some people found his style a little dry and bland, and so they didn't stick around. You, I mean, you got to get people's attention, you know? People like to give me a hard time about the rants, but... People love the rants by and large, and that's sort of why I did them. It's the, that's you know exactly. yeah, the other yeah. thing is that people 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 think that when you get excited like that that you're like you know oh my gosh you're going to the mattresses I'm not going to the mattresses I'm just passionate about what I talk about. There's nothing wrong with that, <laughs> and it shows without a doubt. And I think that that that's the beauty of it, and you attract that kind of audience that appreciates that without uh, without a doubt. And 
<clears throat> hopefully I add, add a sort, sort of a different flavor to that and, and question question everything else and throw some questions at you and hopefully you can answer them. But you know what, at the end of the day, the, the number of viewers that, that any channel gets or any Facebook page has, it's all vanity metrics. Exactly. What, what you really want is, is engagement. And the more, the higher the engagement, the, the more successful you are and the stronger your message and the more people appreciate it. So, well, that's, that's about engagement. Where are the comments? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where's the audience today? It's a, it's a slow day today. No, but, but not exactly. I'm with you 100% on that. That's always what it's been about. For me, again, you know, it's uh, last, not last year. I got to say last year. Now it's going on two years ago. It's a year and a half ago when I first monetized my original channel. And, and, and I was hesitant. You know, once I reached the threshold, because I'd had the channel for 16 years, but only had a couple of videos on it because mm. I was an intelligence officer. Can't exactly going on YouTube, you know. So, so I just put a few <laughs> vacation videos, which I wasn't even the video. It was Waterfalls of Iceland. Uh, anyway, so after 16 years, I finally did something with the channel. And and I, I reached the threshold for a couple of months. And people are like, when are you going to monetize the channel? When are you going to monetize the channel? When are you going to monetize the channel? I'm like, I'm not doing this to make money. I mean, look, look, I'll, I'll take money. People want to throw money at me. I'm not going to turn it down. I mean, that's not. But I didn't do it to make money. I was tr genuinely here to, number one, promote my, my consultancy so that I could get travel back and forth to Africa and have an impact and get American businesses involved in Africa. That's That was the prime, that's the main reason I did it. Second was that uh, once I once the, 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 the consultancy was kind of put on the back burner because of the lockdown, which was almost immediately, I did it to inform people and to reach an audience to tell people what was really going on across Africa. And and my telling people a story across Africa, some people interpret it as being down and negative on Africa. Other people look at it as being honest about Africa. Other people look at it as being up. It just depends on what I'm talking about. Uh, I got attacked by people in Namibia because I reported factually what happened in Caprivi, or now the Zambezi district, as they call it, uh, when the BDF shot and killed three people or four people they suspect of being poachers on Sududu Island or Kisakili Island, if you're from Namibia. Uh, and I, I did a video in which I talked about the history of the International Court of Justice and how it was awarded to Namibia, or not to be to, to Botswana, and, um, and what was going on there. There. And I got attacked endlessly and I was called a racist and all this stuff. I'm like, who even mentioned black or white folks at all? And by the way, how can I be a racist when I'm talking about Botswana and Nimbia, overwhelmingly black countries, and the only people involved in this were black Africans? And I didn't I didn't attack the people that shot anybody. I didn't attack the people that are accused of being poachers. I simply reported the facts. And anyway, so you know, it's just it's 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 actually kind of entertaining in, in many respects. <laughs> I, I I think that there's your problem there. You reported the facts. Nobody likes the facts, and when you report the facts, then people seem to attack you, your personality with it, when, and ad hominem attacks are thrown at, at you left, right, and center. Amazing that, isn't it? That, that when it somebody can't that attack your or the content of of your speech or the content of what you're saying, they attack you you personally and hope to divert you away from from the argument. Uh, I think that's why I love Twitter. <laughs> no, it's exactly exactly right. That's what it does. Now, by the way, you said something a moment ago. I should comment on, but you know, it says that you you hope that you bring kind of a different aspect uh, to our program. And honestly, you know, I really enjoy this program. We've done it. Well, it's the third or fourth time we've done it. Now. I really enjoy it because it really gives me a chance to just kind of let my hair down, calm down, you know, and and not 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 really. Um, focus on certain things. I can really just have a coaching conversation, intellectual conversation, which is what I cherish. And I really miss with this stupid lockdown. I mean, I would typically, since when I first retired the first few months, I would go over to the work college a couple times a month, uh, have lunch with colleagues, you know, not, not to hang on to the work college, but to talk about geopolitics and talk about things. And uh, I would do that. And, and that's just kind of gone by the wayside now. So it's nice to have this opportunity to talk and have a coaching conversation. But it's definitely not uh, definitely not what happens when, when people come after you. Last night on the Common Sense Conservatives, our radio program that we do out of New, New Hampshire, uh, we had a guest on who is a congressional candidate for the legislature in the state of Idaho. And we had a caller. So my, my co-host in the studio took the call and the guy comes on and goes, yeah, so let me, uh, so I understand that, uh, so you're a, you're a, a correctional officer. That's right. I'm, I'm also a law enforcement officer, but I'm a real cop. So you're, you're not a real cop, right? You're just, you, you're in a, I was like, oh, okay, all right, all right. So, so that's how he started, and then, then, then he goes on and on, and then I said something. Oh, you're going to interrupt me now! Oh, you're going to gang up on me! You're going to tip my. And there's all the little like they have a list of things they must go through. All right, as soon as they say something, say this. Then attack him for this. Then my colleague was talking, wow. and we're on camera, by the way, as well as on. This is a radio program, but it is broadcast on social media, so people are watching it there. And he, so my colleague starts talking. Goes, oh yeah, so now Santa Claus is going to jump up on me. And I was silent. I wasn't saying anything. I, obviously, I'm the Santa Claus there. So, But the point is that, uh, you know, what you're getting at, it's just amazing that when they have no argument or no facts, they simply they deflect 
their own shortcomings on you. Oh, you're a homophobe. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Who said anything about homosexuals? You're a transphobe. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with trans. Blair White's a transsexual. I don't have an issue with her. Huh? Yeah. Well, wait a second. We were told that Donald Trump's a racist. Yeah, but Donald Trump gave $500 million to historically black colleges and universities. No president in the history of the United States has ever done that. Mm -hmm. The total amount of funding in the history of the United States, I don't think he's even approached that in the <laughs> aggregate in our entire history. Not that I was for or against it. I'm just stating facts. He also created opportunity zones. He also had twice a month meetings with leaders, civic leaders from black community, which was never covered by the press. He also had the highest vote amongst black Americans in three or four decades for a presidential candidate who was Republican. And the list goes on and on of all the things that Donald Trump did for the black community. Uh, but he's a racist. And of course, before he ran for president, all his friends were rich, connected black celebrities. And suddenly he's a racist. But people fall for it. You know, this thing, um, we'll get to it in a second, but I mean, any comments on that? I mean, just how easy it is that people just to get hoodwinked by, by the nonsense of propaganda that's out there. No, it's dead easy. Absolutely incredibly easy. And that's, that's uh, coming from a marketing background. That's, that's rule number one is that you get people into an emotional state. Once they're in an emotional state, they, they drop all the rational thinking and then you can literally place anything on them and they, and they will follow with that narrative. Also, it's, it's, it's a sign of the times, I think, where you have <clears throat> people classified into certain groups. Oh, he's this kind of person, yeah. therefore he must ful fulfill this criteria. And one of those is, is racist. And also, the whole, the whole term racist has kind of lost its meaning completely. Yeah, it's become so it means nothing. Down because it means nothing. Everyone is a racist. Everyone is a racist. And it's, it's ridiculous. And, oh, well, good for that. Call me racist. I don't care. I don't care because you know and I know that, it, that it's absolutely not true. And we won't even go down that path. So if as soon as someone attacks you and says you're a misogynist or a racist, mm -hmm. racist or whatever, then at that point, you know, you've won the argument and there's no need to continue. You just walk away. Or, That's actually good well, advice I, right there. Yeah, but, or, you know, but you know, Rob, <laughs> okay, go ahead. What do you do? What do you do? What, what I do on Twitter is once we've reached that point, then I start just having fun. Then I treat Twitter as what it's supposed to be. It's yeah. an entertainment channel. And yeah. simple as that. Let's see how far I can take you and how angry I can make you and how angry you think I'm getting. But I'm sitting behind my screen, literally rolling on the floor laughing, seeing how, how ridiculous I can make this conversation because you took it that way. So yeah. Let's go. <laughs> no, I'm with you. Now, now my approach to that, before I say that, I, I, I must say, Rob, that I, I don't think that you're a racist, but math is racist. Did you know that? Math is racist? <laughs> I've heard so. Two plus two sometimes does equal racism. It does. It, <laughs> it absolutely does. It's that algebra. That's where the racism came into play. It was trying to complicate people. But <laughs> oh, did, did, did you just say algebra? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Was, was that a slam? On, uh, anyway. No, but uh, yeah. So my approach on that stuff is that yeah, not to get too far down the rabbit hole, but my approach has been that because uh, I was I was attacked, uh, some, I first started experiencing these attacks on LinkedIn and when I was still serving. On LinkedIn, I published news, I took news reports that came, uh, every day I was putting 20 or 30 news reports that are focused on Africa and I would I would analyze it and report, or just report if it's just news breaking. I'd usually I give a couple, a paragraph or two of analytical comment about what this means or what the impact's gonna be. And I would get attacked by black racists in Africa and white liberals in America who are also racist, but <laughs> I'll get attacked. Uh, and, and my approach to that was that, um, I was a public figure and in uniform and in my job represented the nation. So if they attacked me, I would respond in a non-emotional, perfunctory fashion, restating the facts and pointing it out and saying that what you said is factually correct and give a reference if possible, that sort of thing. And people said, don't respond to it. The problem with not responding to it is that that in effect becomes a record. That's there. That's searchable. That can be found. And if people say you're this, that, and the other and you don't respond to it, and you're in a, in a public capacity like that, then you really set yourself up for later on. Just like, uh, and let me go on this now. So you and I were talking off camera. Uh, Kara Cooney, who is an Egyptologist at the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, just had a book published, The Good Kings, talking about Egypt history and comparing it to modern political issues. And in the book, she stated that Kyle Rittenhouse, a white supremacist, murdered two black men in Kenosha, Wisconsin, as part of his uh, expressing his white patriarchy. I'm like, huh? And this is starting to make the rounds all over the news. And, and this was, this book came out a few weeks back. But her response to this was um, that she was being attacked in a misogynistic attack and that this is just a proof that the patriarchy exists. No, this is proof 
that you as a researcher who is supposedly trying to convince us that you know and can analyze what happened 5,000 years ago in ancient Egypt and we're supposed to trust you, but you can't pick up a newspaper or read or look at the images of, homo, or, of, 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 of Anglo-Saxon people shot by Kyle Rittenhouse, the fact that not a single black person, you simply either intentionally misled or you're so easily duped, which calls into question all of your research. I, I can't possibly trust anything this woman writes. But the point here is that that now, if no one refutes it, if, no, if people just let it slide by, it's published by a reputable publisher, National Geographic Society, in a book nonetheless, and it will appear on the shelves of libraries all around the world. 30 years from now, Rob, when your kids or grandkids are doing research about modern politics U.S., they happen to find this when they do a hit on a search in LexisNexis, assuming it's still around then, and it says this book, and they go, look, and they go, oh, look at this. You see? Yeah, the patriarch. And then they cite that that people believe that because they actually did the research. But it's just propaganda. It's complete nonsense. It's like, remember the Maine. We sunk the Maine. It wasn't the Spanish. We suckered them into a war to take their colonial empire. Here, if you didn't know that, I'm breaking the news today, over a century later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, it's, it's a degradation of um, academic institutions. I think that, that's where it goes. And it starts starts with the funding. So perhaps that she, she got a, a grant to study that, that Egyptology, uh, produce a report, produce a book. And one of the conditions of that, of that grant was, let's bring in an angle of, of white supremacy <clears throat> and link it to some, to some current news. Uh, I have no doubt that's exactly what, what, what happened there, because it happens all over the place. It's, it's not an uncommon, not an uncommon uh, issue there. And we can see it everywhere. There's a lot of, lot of research that goes against the, against the narrative that's been uh, silenced simply because funding has not been provided for that. And it's, it's really, really, really sad because as you say, that does, it does stand to, it does stand the test of time and mm. it does go into the libraries. And the problem there is it's a manipulation of, of history once again. So, and which is a common thing uh, amongst, uh, what should I say, amongst the left there is to change, change the, the historical facts to suit the current narrative, which is why perhaps we have so many um, tertiary education students and university students uh, following, following a very extreme leftist, communist, socialist uh, kind of mindset because they don't know the facts behind it, that communism is, as a result, has never worked, has, has failed absolutely everywhere it goes. Socialism has failed as well. The socialism leads to communism. And it's been responsible for the greatest mass murders in, in history. But no, we put all that aside. We put all that aside because it's, we get painted this rosy picture or this rosy picture is presented to us through, through woke lecturers and so on. And then that it distorts an entire generation's mind and perception of, of, what's, of what's to come. But then hopefully the, the next generation or the, the following generation from that questions it as as young people do they tend to question things so it's a i reckon maybe it's a a regular cycle that it keeps going around from work to to conservative to back to work and and so on and so on and i think we're in that in that cusp of of the changeover period right now i think everybody has woken up to to what's really going on now the great the Great Reset has resulted in the Great Awakening, mm. where people are questioning governments, starting to uh, reignite uh, critical thinking again, and uh, think for themselves. And that <clears throat> that leads to two separate things. There might be a, a, a concerted drive now, or even stronger effort, to manipulate data and facts that do come out. And then from the other side, there might be a, a drive to present the correct facts and, and data and then i find that great i think it's it's that's giving uh, us as the viewers definitely options to choose from there's so many different opinions here that are presented to us every five minutes on social media we we are being forced to do our own research and make up our own minds we no longer listen to what's told to us we actually now take that initiative great times in my opinion i wish there were more of us though unfortunately that number is limited it is growing that audience is growing like that but you know it's interesting about education because from 1982 until 2014 
at uh, various times, I was enrolled in higher education, uh, either a, an associate's, a bachelor's program twice, or three different master's programs. So multiple. So I, I basically continued my education, my, my, my postgraduate education, my undergraduate, postgraduate throughout my adult life for the most part. And in the 1980s, I didn't see any of this in the early 80s. No woke professors, even if they were, they didn't bring it into the classroom. Um, yeah, I was young, but I, I would have remembered that. <laughs> it didn't happen. I went back to university after having been in the army for years and a little bit older in my early 20s. And I did have a leftist uh, teaching assistant, uh, but he was a professor there. He was an associate professor, but he was also playing a role as teaching assistant. But um, anyway, he was an associate professor. And, and he was a leftist and he was talking about, it was a, a world, sort of a world history class, but he didn't bring it into the class. And he told people at the beginning, he said, listen, my views are different than probably a fair number of people in this classroom, but that doesn't affect how we present what's going to come here. If you want to hear my personal views, we could talk about that outside the classroom. And I would go to him occasionally to talk about, you know, a, 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 an essay that was coming up or Simon I was working on because he had open office hours. He's a really great guy. Uh, and we would have conversations. And it was clear that ooh, he had a very different view of the world than I did. But it never came into the classroom. I really respect that to this day. By contrast, just uh, six years later, I wound up uh, teaching at Iowa State University and I took a, did my first master's program in which I did international political economy, um, community and regional planning and um, cultural anthropology of the three subjects I combined for international development studies was my degree. And I did my thesis on the housing subsidy program that ANC was proposing and coming out with to, you know, improve or to get housing to South Africans. Oh, wow. yeah. And um, I came up with a very complicated formula using ugh, regression analysis. God, I hate that, uh, you know, to go that, you know, the thing is that they, they made the subsidy. So if your income is this, you get it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. A, a mother who lives in KZN, who's got five kids and her husband working in, in the high veld in a gold mine, living in a hostel, he shouldn't be getting the money. She should be getting it based on need. She's got five kids, so she needs X square meters and she needs this many abolition units, yada, yada. So I came up with a formula for that and said, here's a better approach to do it. Anyway, um, there was a guy who was a sociology professor there and he was a rabid leftist at Iowa State University. It was an engineering school, so there weren't many social science programs available, but he was a social sociologist there. And he had done a housing survey in Cape Town as part of work he was doing on his doctoral thesis or doctor, his dissertation. And so my major professor convinced me to add him to the committee so I could use his study and we could. So I went to the guy and the first time I saw him, I was wearing fatigues because I teach and I have to teach in uniform. And, and I had class on the other side of campus and it was right next to the building. So I went there and I'm in fatigues and I walked in. You should have seen the look he gave me as if I just came from raping women and murdering babies and having a bry with burning babies two hours ago. It was, I was astounded. I was, and, he, and he was disrespectful and perfunctory and rude to me, made me wait. Every time I would see him, um, We'd have office hours and he'd sit in there and work for 15 or 20 minutes and then finally invite me in. And I almost had enough of this and nearly dropped it from my committee. But it took nearly a year to get through that veneer of stupidity before we had real coaching conversations and actually that, that he contributed to help me do my thesis. It was really, really annoying. And since then, I've seen it continue at other programs. Now, fortunately, my other graduate programs, I mostly didn't deal with it, but I've seen other people have suffered through it. It's really sad to see people bring their personal views into the point where they feel that it's their job to punish you if you don't agree with them. If you don't agree with me, okay, maybe I don't like you. Maybe we would call each other names, but why in the world would I ever take action to harm you? That's just stupid. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, you've sparked so, so many, so many thoughts there. Uh, I'll, I'll bring it back to Twitter because it's a, it's a medium that most of us do, do understand. Uh, I posed a question on, on Twitter the other mm -hmm. day, a simple question uh, for something that I really didn't know the answer to. And uh, so you were legit, you were legitimately asking a legit question. And it was, uh, what is long COVID? That, that was my question. Mm -hmm. And a few people, a few people answered, but majority of, of, of people thought I was taking the piss. They yeah. really did. Yeah. And they started attacking me and assumed that, that, I, that I actually did know what, what long COVID was. I, I can't find a, a, a genuine definition for it. it the, every, every definition seems to differ. Nobody seems to really give a, give a coherent definition of what it is. But especially from from the regular antagonists on, on, on Twitter, they just attacked me and said, of course, you know, and this is what it is, an oh, typical question from you. And then, you know, <laughs> and then started attacking the way I phrased it and punctuation and, and so on. It was, it was quite, quite eye opening, I have to I have to say, then a few people actually posted articles and definitions and references to, to, to cool. other articles to explain it. And for that, I was grateful. But when can we get to that point 
excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold here. When, when can we get to that point? It's Rona. It's Rona. <laughs> yes. Oh, no. Oh, no. oh my God. It's <laughs> Omicron. Omicron. <laughs> yes. Attacking me from the side. Run away. <laughs> Run away. <laughs> but when can we get to that point where we can have those honest, open debates and you can ask genuine questions and people don't think that you have an, an ulterior motive behind what you're doing? It was a genuine question. I would have appreciated feedback from those who believe and from those who don't. No. That, that's exactly what I was trying to do. What medium can we do that on? We can't do it on Facebook. We can't do it on Twitter. We can't do it on, on any, any platform. So where do we have these discussions? Where do we have these, uh, I'm not going to say debates because a debate implies a, yeah. a winner and a loser. But no, but a, coach, have, a cogent conversation is all you're asking for. Yes. Where we can both learn from from what's presented and yeah. then walk away both enriched from with new knowledge. I, I don't know if, if there is such or such a place exists. But, well, it, it's tough, and if it is, it'll be it'll be um, you know it'll be uh, invaded by people who want to cause problems. But you know, I, I know you've got more to say there. But let me just add to that. I, I think here's a legitimate question too, and I'm I'm, I'm I'm I ask a question not to have a piss, but I am being a bit snarky at times. But it's a legitimate question I've asked in a legitimate fashion. President Biden told us in last year that we wouldn't get sick, you know, yada, yada. Then it came, you won't get serious illness. It, it, you know, if you get the jabs, you don't get serious illness. What is serious illness? How do you gradiate that? Is it 5%, 10%, 15%? Is it this temperature? Is it that temperature? Is it this number of days you're ill? This days you're not ill? What is serious illness? To someone who never falls ill like myself, being sick for five days is serious, you know? <laughs> I've been sick in three yeah. years and suddenly I get sick. That kind of gets my attention. And for some people who are sickly, unfortunately, and they deal with illness all the time, it might just be hey, it's nothing. I mean, it's just ludicrous. And it reminds me of one of the most useful things I learned in high school. I had a high school English teacher in rural Appalachia, and she was talking about using descriptive words, adjectives, you know, and how they can be totally useless. And this is the perfect example. If, if someone writes, well, he's nice enough. What does that mean? Nice enough, nice compared to what? How, what, what does that mean? I've never forgotten that statement. It's, it's really made a big difference. And as an adult in, in my writing, helped me improve it going and going, being very clear about what I'm trying to say. So what is serious illness? I mean, cancer is serious to me if you're not in remission, you know, leukemia is serious, you know, uh, you know, a sucking chest wound, that's pretty serious. But I mean, what is serious illness in relationship to the Rona epidemic? We don't know because Dr. Fauci doesn't define it. And all these sheep around the world, whether you believe in what's going on or not, that's not the argument. The issue is this. Why don't you ask them to tell us what that means? Because we were told if you got the jab, you don't fall ill. I got the video footage of Trump, or not Trump, of of of, of uh, Biden saying this months ago when he was president. If you get the jab, you won't fall ill. I didn't make that up. He said it. If you get the jab, you can't make other people sick. If you get the jab, you won't go to hospital and you won't die. And oh, by the way, you can't pass it to other people. This is a disease of the unvaccinated. Of course, that was a lie. We knew it was a lie all along. And you got censored for it if you asked the question. Why can't we ask that simple question? And why do people get so emotional and attack you for saying, I just want the answer to that question? I'm not being argumentative here. I mean, I think it's a fair question, Rob. What is serious illness? Define that for me, and then I've got a baseline to go off of. Absolutely. Exactly. And what happens if you if you don't present it as, uh, you, need, you need a, I say a benchmark, a benchmark. Okay, a flu or a flu or cold that's that's not serious or it is serious depending on 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 your flu scale flu can be serious. To. We lose thirty five yeah. to fifty thousand people every year in the U S. from flu exactly, and, and six hundred fifty thousand exactly. a year. Uh, first, norm, in a normal year, six hundred fifty thousand people with respiratory related induced by influenza die every year around the world. So it is serious, but for a small percentage yes. of the population. Exactly. Exactly. And, and now you're actually presenting facts, which I can relate to. If, you do, if people aren't presented with the facts, then we, we, we create that scale based on our own experiences. And, um, and then it's completely open to interpretation. As you say, what's serious for me might not be serious, serious for you. Mm -hmm. So to say that Corona was serious, well, ooh, it, it's, it, to me, it, it just thinks of a, of a uh, propaganda and a marketing term. It's <clears throat> new and improved Corona more serious than the previous one <laughs> <clears throat> or or in K omicron case not so serious but it can be serious if we combine it with something else uh, but again let's look at the facts 99.97 percent survival rate that's not serious that doesn't even warrant or justify 
the man- the man- mandatory vac- vaccinations. No, or let alone the lockdowns. The lockdowns. No. Look at, you know, Who I'd- in their right mind would get vaccinated when you have uh, a 99.97% chance of survival? That is absolutely ridiculous. And any- but most people don't know the facts. No, they don't. And if anybody even looked at reality, I mean, I'm far more terrified of, terrified of tuberculosis than I am of the corona. I mean, I know about tuberculosis. It's highly infectious. It's even easier to catch than this stuff is. Maybe not for Omicron. That's the super, you know, you know, adhesive variant. Super adhesive corona. It's called Omicron. But before that, I mean, tuberculosis was likely easier to acquire. Uh, so much time in Africa where it's endemic, especially in Southern Africa, it's a real threat. And and think of the places I go in, in poverty-stricken areas where people live in poor sanitation conditions and poor ventilation conditions. That's part of my work for development and for security. And I've... Knock on wood, after three decades in Africa, have never contracted or have never been exposed to it, so don't have the antibodies, which is good. Because once you've been exposed to it, then you're always positive for TB when you take a TB time test. So I've been very fortunate, but that's a really serious thing. And it killed more people in 2020 than Corona did. 34,000, at least in South Africa, died from tuberculosis. 31. Did we shut the country down? Did we shut the world down? No, we didn't. This is just this hysterical reaction. And here's the thing I always fall back on now, Rob. It's been 27 months and I published something. Now, this was, again, I wasn't taking a piss. I was making a point. And I said, look at this article from three years or four years ago from the World Health Organization in which they admit that 650,000 people per year pass away from influenza. Now, the reason I did this is because Justice Gorsuch had uh, said hundreds of thousands of people die every year from it. Uh, from influenza, and he was fact-checked by fake fact-checkers on the left, and no, no, that's not true, that's not true. Um, well, he didn't say globally, but the number is true for the global, and that's, that's all I said. I said, whatever his intent was, what he said is a factual statement. Maybe he didn't understand it, or maybe he misled, but but the bottom line is 650,000 people, and this is the article, and I put it in there from LinkedIn. I got attacked by, not attacked, but I got a response from someone, and she write back, and she says, yes, you're, you're right, it is dangerous, it's, and that's a valid article, but... 5.4 million people have died from corona. I said, wait a second. 5.4 million deaths attributed to corona. We know that some of those aren't real. New York in uh, March of 2020 went from 6,400 fatalities. The next day it was 10,300. And the press like, uh, excuse me, uh, how do we jump so much? Oh, we're counting deaths we believe are related to. Did you test them? Nope. So you just think they died from it. Okay, well, he had a respiratory issue, so it was that. Anyway, so we know that some of this is dodgy, but let's accept the 5.4 million, Rob. Okay, we'll just accept that. 5.4 million, not in 12 months. I was talking about a 12-month period, 650,000 influenza deaths globally. That's 27 months of data, people dying from this, 27 months. Divide that into 5.4 million, 5. million out of a population of 9 billion or 8 billion on the planet, whatever it is, and mm-hmm. you sort of get perspective on this. Because then they'll come back with nonsense that's unproven. Well, you know, like places like Africa, people just dying in the bush. Nobody ever tests them. No, they're not. Stop making stuff up. <laughs> the so-called excess deaths. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, indeed. You know, the biggest, the biggest problem I, I, I have with our with our local um, uh, National Institute of Communicable Diseases uh, in NICD, and mm-hmm. they put out daily stats. Yep. And it's it, it's a rolling total. Right. Why do we have really? a, why don't we have the stat for the year to date? That's yeah. the one that matters, not, or a calendar year or a fiscal year, not the cumulative. To- I mean, that's what I said in the article. I said, should I add the 35 million dead people from malaria <laughs> since 1990 and say that 35 yes. million people have died from malaria? Would that shut down the world? Maybe. No, exactly. And that, that just shows you that. It's the dishonest. Whole- it, it's totally dishonest, but it's not just dishonest. It's a manipulation of yep. of data and statistics, yep. which is which is worse than than dishonest in my opinion, because that you're taking uh, proper data and you manipulating it and presenting it in a fashion to drive a narrative, and that narrative is misleading, completely misleading. We can look the the fact that the beauty about statistics is you can present them in any way to drive a, any narrative you want. However, in this case to change policy, to place restrictions on people, to take away their their, their civil liberties and, and rights and so on. It's it's been an absolute catastrophe. It has be, literally been a, a pandemic of, of data. 
That's all it has been. All it's been data a pandemic of misinformation and manipulation is what it's been. I what I'd say. Yeah. But you know, you 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 make a very good valid point, which is an apropos segue right into something I want to talk about about South <laughs> Africa specifically. Last week, in a little noticed but now widely noticed attack on the judiciary and the justice system and South Africa in general. Uh, Lindawe Sisuzlu, the permanent minister who's been a minister in government for 21 years, holding eight different ministerial positions and a member of parliament since 27 April 1994. She's never done anything and she's resting on mommy and daddy's laurels as liberation icons. Uh, Lindawe Sisuzlu, who's accomplished nothing in her life, and I'll go out on a limb and say that because I think I can back it up, other than being a loyal cadre, is feeling her oats and seems to want to test the waters about, is Cyril vulnerable? Can I become the president at the age of 67? I want to make that move now. So she writes an op-ed, which not many people paid attention to, but suddenly it got traction. And of course, the sycophants on that side support her come out, oh, anybody criticizing her because she's a black woman. No, uh, people are criticizing her because she's a buffoon and she lies talking about data being manipulated. So she says in there that, you know, 8% of South Africa's population owns 80% of the land. Well, first off, that's factually incorrect. I wrote an article on land and poverty in 2018 in which I used the 2017 land survey, land audit by the South African government. Now, let me just run a couple of figures by you. First off, the reason we both know why she says 8% is because that's roughly equivalent to the so-called white population of South Africa. So she's race hustling, trying to demonize white South Africans as owning all the land, 80%. That's unfair. How can just 80% own or 8% own 80% of land. That's unjust. And that's why we're all poor. That's why black people, by the way, she's not poor. She's got a lot of money. Uh, anyway, so so that's her intent. That's what she's doing. She's race hustling, trying to demonize 4.8 million white South Africans. That's reprehensible. It's scumbag. It's disgusting to begin with. It's also factually incorrect. The audit from 2017 regarding farmland, which is what the really issue is. I mean, we could play games about, you know, you know, hectares around house and stuff like that. But farmland, you know, productive lands we're talking about. 181,532 individual landowners. Now, some corporations own land. That's a different story. But 181,532 individual landowners in South Africa. That represents, wait for it, wait for it, 0.0034% of South Africans own land. So how can 8% of the population, the whites, own 80% of the land when 0.0034% 0.0034% of the population owns land. It's a total lie meant to demonize white people and bifurcate people based on race when this is the fact. Now, people can accuse me and say, wait a second, but you're not talking about the acreage. Those, those The whites that own that land, they own 80% of it. Well, maybe they do. I don't know the acreage because that's further than important. But the bottom line is this. Even this statistic of 0.0034 is even worse than that because of that figure, only 53% of these individual landholders are white. So not only do the whites not the entire white population, babies in their crash, are they not landowners, 8% of the population, but only 95,673 of the 4.8 million whites own land in 2017. And and she takes this from a popular standpoint and thousands will believe it and eat it up like it's bubble gum and pop and sesua and have a good meal at it. And it's just total nonsense, racist propaganda. Uh, she actually said some good things in her op-ed attacking the government, but that's just to score points. Anyway, so this is what people do with data and they lie. And because I look like this and I'm pigmentation challenged, um, there'll be a number of people that won't even listen to my argument and listen to the facts. And the other piece of this is I'm not even a South African. I don't own land there. I have no resources there. I have no dog in the fight. I have no Afrikaner ancestors, no Jewish ancestors. No, I have no ancestors in South Africa whatsoever. No, no blood ties to the country. And I think that it's legitimate for me to make this conversation discussion. And of course, a lot of people won't even listen to it because they're going to listen to the nonsense she comes up with. Total distortion of information. Yeah. And that, that's the weirdest thing because people should be listening to you as, as an outsider. You have a unique perspective and it's, it's untainted, as, as you say, yet, yet they don't. They, they just go for, for surface, surface emotional value. Uh, but there again, it's, it's, do the facts really matter in, in these kind of uh, arguments? Yeah. Um, well, for us, they do. But yeah. for the majority of people, they don't because they either simply don't understand them or they just don't want to believe them. And I find that a fascinating, a fascinating problem with this human psyche is that we will believe lies before we believe the truth. Yeah. And why, why is that? Chris? Why, it why is, it is truly odd because the lie is easier to believe, especially if it's a difficult yeah. truth. I mean, you know, for instance, uh, some of it's acculturation, obviously it's, it's acculturation, but I mean, yeah. think about this, you know, historically it's not been unusual 
if a woman is attractive and she's dressed in skimpy clothing and she gets sexually assaulted to go, well, she had it coming. People say that, they actually believe that. And how could you possibly believe it's okay to violently assault someone else and invade their physical corporeal being because of the way they dress? That's ridiculous. But I mean, but you know, but people actually believe that. Fortunately, a smaller and smaller number of people. But I mean, that's people are strange, you know. And and I'll tell you what, people are easily manipulated. That's for darn sure. Oh yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. And they, they, it's no more evident than in than in politics in South Africa. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Vi Od yeah, Odin's Vi Od easy. Odin's Viking said a few minutes ago. I, I saw this in chat, and I didn't get to. It. He said, "You know, death is a serious illness." <laughs> <laughs> Well, I agree with that, Odin's Viking. I agree. Death is a serious illness. And uh, that's, uh, have, yeah. But imagine if you had COVID, death would be so much worse. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah. Uh, because it'd be much worse on your way to that final path because you had the Rona. So good Lord. Yeah. Oh my god. Did you see, in, in, did you see in Europe, uh, yeah. I think it was Spain, Spain was actually calling for uh, COVID-19 to be treated as a um, endemic disease like the flu. And they, they've, they're calling to drop all restrictions and treat it just like an annual flu. I wonder why that is. Perhaps because it because it is just like the annual flu. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, listen. You know, it's, it's it's here's the whole thing. So, uh, having worked in, uh, in in epidemiological programs and run them and finance them and plan for them and all over Africa, uh, I'm not an epidemiologist. I don't claim to be one. I'm not making that claim. I'm also not a medical professional. Although I've been mistaken, and that's a true statement for both of those things. I'm in fact, I'll tell a little war story. In uh, Ivory Coast, I was there in 2000 doing my sort of intern travel around Africa as an army and uh, foreign area officer. And I went to Liberia, or not Liberia, to Ivory Coast. And one of the things I want to do there is I asked the embassy to set up a meeting with the Centers for Disease Control because they had a research facility there looking at HIV because you had type 1 and type 2. And uh, it was the only place in Africa where type 2 was was, was common. It was usually just type one you found it. So I was curious about that. I did a lot of research on HIV because I realized that it was a it was a game changer that could destroy productivity and erase gains in Africa's development. And I made this reach this conclusion in the mid 1990s before it, even, it blew out in Africa. Anyway, so I went there and uh, I sat down with a guy who was a clinician. Uh, he's a medical practitioner, and I'm asking all these questions. And one of my colleagues who had just been assigned to the embassy, but the same career field I was in, but a year ahead of me, so he's already working in an embassy as assistant army attaché. So my, the, his boss the colonel said go along with chris and you'll learn something so he went with me and we went there and i'm asking all these questions and the guy said so if you don't mind me asking i was just curious where did you go to medical school i mean did you are you on the east coast or west coast i'm like medical school i, I didn't go to medical school you're you're, you're not a physician no I, i'm 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 a lay person what how do you know so much about hiv I said, because I'm an intelligence analyst. I mean, that's my primary job, not this job, but that was my job before. And to me, um, if you want to understand what's going on, you've got to understand everything, culture, language, yeah. economics, politics, geography, all this stuff, you know, it all comes into play and uh, pandemics are serious. And he was just, he was just befuddled by that. Absolutely, absolutely befuddled by it. Now that's the war story I started telling. I forget why I started telling that war story. It's, I went too far down the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> it went too far down the rabbit hole. It was probably about why Spain has, has started treating the... Oh, that's uh, what it was, endemic the disease and stuff. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's, yeah. there you go. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> thank you for bringing me back to, ooh, just reel it back in here. Whoa, we got an 80 pounder here, man. Yeah, it's a uh, barrack. Kuda. Shows about. That's right. We bring it. We bring it back. Will they answer the question? No, never. <laughs> not going to do it. Not wouldn't be prayed. Not at this juncture. Anyway, George Herbert Walker Bush. That was so funny with David, Dana Carvey back in the day. Kids under the age of thirty going, "What's he talking about?" Anyway, but uh, yeah. No, but uh, <laughs> no, but uh, epidemic disease. So, so when 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 Trump banned Chinese nationals and Chinese Chinese flight, but only Americans could be repatriated in January. Uh, by the way, there were two confirmed cases in the United States when he did that, but he was slow to react. Remember that? Slow to react. And then, then he was a racist because he banned Chinese nationals, which <laughs> isn't a race. It's a nationality. Anyway, so anyway, so never mind that. We'll forget all about that. But he banned it. It was too late because the only way for it to have been effective would have been the following. He should have banned all border crossings at all U.S. ports, airports, and seaports effective immediately. He should have isolating quarantine every arrival coming from China that was already en route, not letting them out until they clearly were no longer ill because some of them lied. They didn't have symptoms, and but they felt kind of down and they didn't tell anybody and they went home and spread all over the country. Because by not shutting down all travel, he simply let the Chinese flee Wuhan. He didn't let them. They went to the coastal cities. They infected people on cruise ships. Remember the first cruise ships were the first thing off the coast of Japan. And then they got on planes and flew back to Italy where they run the garment industry now. It's not the Italians anymore. And they infected and killed lots of old people in Italy. 
and spread throughout Europe and people got on flights and flew to the United States through the other door from the Atlantic side and brought it in from there and flew from Europe to Africa, South Africa and brought it in from there. So this con concept of contact tracing uh, works at the outbreak. It only, so the fact that we're still doing it and lockdowns only work at the outbreak when you can contain it. I have said since March of 2020, and I stick by this, that these are stupid reactions, stupid measures because they're ineffective. Now, we just had a bunch of people in Antarctica test positive for it. A lockdown will work there. You can keep people coming in and out. You can isolate people there. That'll work. But you can't do it in a country of 330 million, a country of 60 million people in which the cops aren't even in the townships because when they do go there, they murder black South Africans and they run away. We don't want bad press. It's, it's just ludicrous because it is an endemic disease. And it has been an endemic disease since the day it exited Wuhan. And that's just a reality. And if anybody doesn't want to believe that, then they don't understand how these things work and they're just deluding themselves. And that's the point. It is endemic. It's about time that people start treating it as such and move on. Exactly. And I, I couldn't agree more. And the, the way that it, it's, it starts and the way people start to, to end it, because it's, it's up to us to end it. No, no one else is going to end it. The government certainly does not want to end it. Oh, they love, they love the power. <laughs> they love the power. They're drunk and once on they it. have that power, they will never re relinquish that, that power. So it's up to us. And the first step to, to ending it is ditch the mask. Ditch the mask. Refuse to wear your mask. Stop wearing it. And oh, that, that is where it is. Yeah. The mask is nothing more than a, than a symbol of... It's virtue um, signaling of, of, of obedience. I, it is exactly that. It's a symbol of fear. I, I think it is. It's all it is. It well, and it's fear, funny you should say makes... that, Rob. It's funny you should say yeah. that because for years traveling around, I would always see Chinese nationals, particularly coming to Africa, wearing masks yes. because they always have yes. influenza outbreaks in China. I'm like, what the hell's wrong with you people? I mean, you know, you're not sneezing or hacking or coughing or spitting. Uh, I'm okay. You know, I, it, you know, and, and I'd always almost kind of laugh at them. I mean, almost li literally, <laughs> I didn't laugh at them, but I mean, I had to hold back a chuckle. I'm like, what a bunch of cowards. What are you afraid of? You know, uh, that's what I saw for 20 years. People, you know, Chinese travel. And it's usually about a third or more of the Chinese would be wearing surgical masks. I'm like, what the hell's wrong with you people? Anyway, so are they afraid Africans yeah. are going to breathe on them or something? That's what I used to ask, you know. Anyway, so, yeah, it's, you know. <laughs> maybe, maybe they are. Maybe they are. It is. But maybe maybe it was also part of the the whole propaganda thing. Well, it's the, the, it's, the it's, Chinese it's, people it, actually they're convinced to wear. They're acculturated to do it and behave now. That's why they did it. Exactly, exactly mm -hmm. correct. And, oh, hello, Chinese social credit system. Mm -hmm. And we know what that's all about. And that's coming coming globally as well. And that's a terrifying thought. Do you know much about the uh, Chinese social credit system? And how I, they, I know a fair amount about it. What's interesting is that it was actually um, the storyline for a sci-fi show. What's that show called? The uh, Oh, gosh, with <laughs> Seth MacFarlane. I can't think of the name of it right now. He had a show that was on Fox for a couple of years, and now it's 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 on one of the Netflix or something like that. Um, oh, gosh, can't think of it. It's, it's kind of like like Star Trek, but it's it's a drama, but it's a comedy drama or whatever. You know, it's it's also got comedy on it. Seth MacFarlane, of course, used to be with Saturday Night Live, I think, years ago. But anyway, uh, really really funny show. And in that, they land on a planet, and on the planet, uh, the guy is uh, there's a black guy with them, and he, he's joking around. There's a statue of someone. He starts like joking around and, and like he's riding a horse or humping it. And he get arrested and his social credit scores and he goes like millions in the hole. So he's given a trial and he's scheduled for execution for, for having a poor social credit score. And they're like, what the hell's going on here? They, they, what can we do? You know, we can't interfere with the politics of this world. Anyway, so it just reminded me where this can go. And that's exactly, you know, and it's, it's funny, Rob, because, well, it's not funny. It's sad. Actually, I'm reading a book by um, John, is it John Douglas? thing? is the original mind hunter, the original uh, profiler for the FBI's behavioral analysis unit. The first guy to do it. And he's written a few books. One of them was Mindhunter, and they've made a Netflix series, which is really good, by the way, on that. And yeah. yeah, it's an excellent series. And then, uh, of course, he read his book, wrote his book, and he wrote another book. And the one I'm reading now was written uh, several years ago, but I just read the part about John Benet Ramsey, the murder of that little uh, pageant showgirl. And, and it's very poignant reading at this stage in history because it's been long ago enough that I can remember the emotions that were evoked in all of us by the lying police department in Boulder and also by the media. And, and, you know, the things that they told people were simply fabricated. They made up stories about, you know, he had books about, he had he had that book by by Douglas, The Mindhunter, you know, so he'd get out of, you know, how to get around and commit a crime and get away with it. And it's not the case. He didn't even ever even heard of this guy, never heard of the book until after he came on his defense team and then investigated him. And then he found out about the book and he read it after the fact. And they just go on like the, she was a pageant queen. She went to all these pageants. It turns out that almost all the photographs were like in just a three-month period where she had several 
events going on, you know, in the summertime, and she went to all of them. And then, like, you know, well, the daughter was didn't want to do it anymore. She was angry at her mom. In fact, uh, everyone says factually the daughter was the one that really enjoyed it. She was a natural. She liked to show off, and it was, and the, the, everything that was put into the press to make us hate, just like Kyle Rittenhouse, white supremacist. He went there. He took a gun from out of state. You know, to, all of it was lies. Shot black people. Killed black. All lies. And people were so easy to manipulate. And I thought back of myself because I was overseas. I wasn't paying much attention to this, but I was thinking to myself, I saw the images. And I'm like, wow, what kind of parents are they? That was a question I asked. Turns out there were wonderful, loving parents who were not guilty and their lives were destroyed. And then and the sad part of that is, is his, the mother had had ovarian cancer. She recovered, then it recurred, and she died at the age of 49, 2006, never knowing who murdered her child. It's just really sad how people are manipulated by this nonsense. It's really, and, and if, if you do it that level, Imagine what they do with real things that matter about budgets and policy and decisions about who wins and loses. It's pretty scary. It is. It is. I think what's even more more scary is, is that um, majority of people don't believe you when, yeah. when, when you tell them this. They don't, they don't believe that. Sorry, but we are ruled by a bunch of psychopaths. And <laughs> yeah, we, they, seem they, to, we seem to be. <laughs> we definitely are. I, I, which reminds me, I had such a laugh at that. There's a video going around on, on Twitter or social media about, um, uh, who was it? Oh, uh, Trudeau or Justin Trudeau yep. sitting next, uh, next to uh, Bolsonaro and reaching out for, for a handshake and Bolsonaro just turns his back on him. It was absolutely brilliant. That's classic. Actually, have you seen it? No, I haven't. I love it. I'm going to have to get that clip. That's brilliant. Oh, it is absolutely. He literally, he literally looked at him, turned around and then started talking to someone in, in, on, on his, on his left hand side. <laughs> and old Trudeau's left hanging in the background going, um, uh, uh, um, and you can see his total confusion. It was, to me, that is the, the video clip of, of, of the year so far. Nah, that's it absolutely, that's absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Uh, uh, just real quick, uh, <laughs> Rob, uh, there's a question here from John Jarvis asking if he can mail us questions. Yeah, we mentioned it last time. We probably should make some kind of little banner. Uh, I assume, John, you want to ask the question next time so that uh, we're prepared or do research for it. But I'm putting in the link to my link tree, which is something that now I'm paying for access to, which lets me get pre uh, you know, my current YouTube video shows up on there when you click on it. Also, there's a PayPal thing there. So YouTube doesn't take 30 percent if you want to support the independent journalism. Uh, and it links to all of my most of my social media sites and, and channels. Uh, so the Twitter and the YouTube have the current either tweet or video that's up, which is kind of handy. But also in there, you'll find um, a way to write to me on there as a form so you can send me comments, which will be automatically sent to my email. Or you can click the little icon at the bottom for email and you can send email. So if you've got questions for the program that you want to ask for a future week or on a topic or suggest a topic, feel free to put in there because I can't catch all the stuff in, in the comments. We're missing some of that. But John Jarvis, you're welcome to it. If you've got a question for today, feel free to ask it, John. We're happy to try to address it as best as possible. Um, you know, the show is called Answer the Question, but we're not obliged to do so, so. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, we well, we can pick and choose which ones we exactly like. <laughs> exactly oh so, so it reminds me i don't think i did i, I didn't tell the story did i was um so last night on the radio uh on my radio program common sense service i think i got away from it we had a guy call in did i tell the story already or were you and i talking yeah. off air i think it was off air anyway so so we had a guy call in we had this representative from idaho on there and the guy calls in and he says uh yeah so um so um, I'm a law enforcement official also, but like, uh, not, did I understand you're a correction officer? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I'm a correction officer. Uh, oh, so not a real cop like me. And then right there, I knew that we had some leftist troll on there. And I just, I started laughing. It was just, it was just, just you know, it's, uh, anyway, that's right. I think we did talk about that earlier. There you go. Did, Sen yeah. Senior moment there. Senior moment. <laughs> too, too many programs, too many videos. You forget whether you talked about something or not. So. <laughs> you do. I, I, I find that as well. So, did I talk about this? Let me just say it again. Someone will stop me. <laughs> well, it might just get worse because uh, now I've got uh, a, a, a fortnightly. Not, no, not fortnight. We're not playing fortnight. A fortnightly program with uh, Vian Dutoy. Every other Monday now, mm -hmm. he'll be appearing and we'll be doing Fireside with the Colonels. And then uh, I'm in the process of setting up something with Man Patry, with Duma Dengo, and uh, and mm -hmm. Koketsu Rosani, uh, doing a regular program with them as well. So uh, that's my that's uh, my dance Getting card is my dance card is filling up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yes, I have to book books some more time. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, they, they, they were. We, we touched on um, land expropriation. And yeah, that is definitely re reared its ugly head again. Uh, President Ramaphosa recently said that. Um, although the the uh, amending the section twenty five the section what was it the constitution eighteenth amendment bill 
has was vetoed out of out of parliament through through majority vote they the ANC will still pursue land expropriation without compensation through other means and that's obviously going to be the uh, expropriation bill which has been around for, around for some time um i find it fascinating that they they can be so I don't know, belligerent and in, in going ahead with that thing it's it's absolutely crazy when Parliament, majority of Parliament has, has voted against it, they still want to bring it through. And virtually none, of the, of, the none of the population no. wants it. Virtually none of the public wants no. it. Yeah. So well, let me, uh, you have to wonder what's the driving driving motive behind well, this. Well, they're, 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 they, they're stupid and they think that that's their key to attracting votes. It's not. So yeah. let me ask a real yeah. question. Here's a serious question. This is not being a smart ass. I know the answer and I'm sure you do too. But, but let me just ask this as an outside observer to South Africa. Uh, the Constitution allows for expropriation already. The government can take things in the public interest land, and the person who owns the land has no say. They can appeal it, but the government has the final decision. Now, the only difference is you have to pay and compensate the person for it. So why can't the government, or why hasn't the government, appropriated sufficient land to meet the claims of needs that it says are out there to date in 28 years? Now, we know the answer is going to be, well, there isn't any money. Well, that's not true. He spent 7.1 billion U.S. dollars buying Type 2 and 9 diesel submarines, Gripen fighters, which are sitting on the ground grounded. And by the way, the submarines are also, you know, sitting in port, and the cruisers are sitting in port, and the Hawk lead-in fighter trainers. Oh, gee, gosh, somebody outside South Africa knows what you're up to. And we could go on and on with the with the energy with the uh, oil gate where they sold the strategic reserve to a black economic empowerment company for a fraction of the value of it, and then paid him a contract to maintain it. We can go on with the travel gate where members of government fly in first class and are not authorized to do it. We can go on with Encon, the, the endless list of corruption scandals and pilfered trillions of rand, hundreds of billions of dollars, and there's no money to buy land. This past year in the fiscal budget, the South African ministry or department responsible for land restitution was given $35 million for land acquisition. Yet they gave half a billion to a failed, corrupt South African Airways to rescue it. So, so the real question is, you have a mechanism for restoration. And oh, by the way, what about the 75,000 land claims? There's still about 1,000 outstanding, but 74,000 plus have been resolved. Why are those 1,000 outstanding? Why don't you tell people about that? Why don't you deal with that? And why aren't you redistributing land? Why do you have to steal property from people? It, why is it necessary? That's a legitimate question, but of course they can't answer it because the truth hurts. Exactly. And the, I think that, that it's just, it's pure uh, political pandering, once again, from, from Ramaphosa and from Lamola. And what, what they don't realize is it has a, a far-reaching detrimental effect on investments, foreign investments, and, and so on in, in the country. When you create uncertainty and an unstable environment, no investor is, is going to say, hey, let's, let's put a couple of billion dollars into, into South Africa, build, build plants and build factories and, and so on, because we fear they're going to be taken away. And I, I think... I really don't understand why Soro Raposa keeps pushing this or why the, the ANC government keeps pushing it when it's really a, a tiny a tiny minority of, of, of people who, who, who would actually benefit from it. And as, as you pointed out earlier on, uh, most people don't own land in, in South Africa. The government owns a huge, huge amount, amount of land, which they haven't been giving out. They, ha they don't use. They don't use effectively. So let, let's start there. But then... In the same breath, they, they talk about um, extending this uh, relief grant for, for COVID. And 11 million people in South Africa receive social grants as it is. That's a huge amount of, of people. And the ANC seems quite, excuse me, <clears throat> ANC seems quite proud of that fact that they've lifted the number of social grants from 3 million up to 11 million uh, in, 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 since they've been in power. How can any government claim that as an achievement any government should be looking to reduce the number of of social grants it really makes no sense and now they want to increase it to uh, include a basic income grant where everyone gets a basic income grant where is this money going to come from that's going to cost this country easily 500 billion rand a year to, to service such, such an initiative yeah I saw it, it blows my mind I'm so, coming from? I, it's not coming from so it's, it's maybe the Chinese I don't know but 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 the, the loans the World Bank the IMF but but I, I laugh not not at you or what you're saying but when I, I'm thinking exactly back and how, how can any government be proud that they're putting people on government assistance and, and, and in poverty you know under Barack Hussein Obama 
they crowed about the fact that 45 million Americans were drawing food stamps to buy their food. Um, that was a record number of people on it. When Trump became president, the number declined by, I don't know, six or eight million or so. It was lower. It went down from 45 million. It was, it was much lower, but millions of people came off of food stamps. And of course, the left used that to attack Donald Trump. Well, look at this. He's cutting food stamps. Actually, there were no cuts in the program. There was no changes in eligibility levels. People got employment because jobs came back. They had an income and were no longer eligible for food stamps because they exceeded the threshold. And they attacked the guy for people having better lives and income rather than being dependent on the state and draining the taxpayer and the fiscus. The the logic of these people, of course, they know the truth. They know the truth, but the public doesn't because I don't mean to insult my audience because my audience is pretty bright, but let me insult the world. You're a bunch of dumbasses, man. Wake up and look about what's going around all around you. Stop being sheep. This isn't hard. It isn't advanced calculus. It's not particle physics. You don't have to sit around and calculate the trajectory of the Falcon 9 rocket that's currently orbiting Earth with the South African meteorological satellites and do it with complicated geometry and algebra. No, no, no. All you got to do is ask basic questions. Okay, so less people are on food stamps. Did they cut benefits? No. How come less people? Because they got jobs. Oh, that's a good thing. (laughs) Job's always a good thing. As, as any politician will tell you, we're going to create jobs. We have no idea how, but we're going to create them. You know, on, on that note, you mentioned nano satellites. What what are nano satellites? And suddenly, South Africa has a few a few orbiting because of. Oh, you have a constellation. You have a constellation of nano satellites. Three constellation of nano satellites. What exactly is a nano satellite, and what does South Africa use them for? Nano satellites. Uh, the South South Africa put a satellite a couple of years ago. It was a small one. It was a testing it to provide maritime data. But now you have three that are going in orbit. They're, they're actually on the vehicle now. I don't know if they've been deployed, but maybe around now or sometime today they'll be deployed. Uh, but those three satellites will provide uh, meteorological and uh, oceanographic data. They're maritime domain awareness. So that's what they say. I think they're going to be used to spy on what ships are around South Africa's shores. That is maritime domain awareness, <laughs> which, by the way, you can give for free, courtesy of the U.S. government. We have a maritime domain awareness system, which we make available to sovereign states all over the world. And I know this because I installed the transmitters and the resp- and the yeah. transceivers in Liberia along the coast. And this system allows maritime authorities in countries around the world to log into an unclassified uh, database on a computer, which the U.S. maintains, pays for. And uh, what happens is that ships over a certain tonnage, these huge you know, cargo ships and, super, and oil super tanks, stuff like that, they voluntarily are part of this program and it sends a signal back and forth so that uh, maritime authorities know where these ships are. And why would they do that? Well, search and rescue if something happens, if there's piracy, people know where the ship was last at. So there's, there's a reason why ships would do it on a voluntary basis. But it's also to let you know what's in your maritime area. And of course, in South Africa, having a long seashore going all the way around from east to west in a loop like this, and I have kind of a smile, you know, um, you want to know what's going on there, what ships are transiting, especially Chinese ships. But anyway, not just European fishing trawlers too. So um, that's what it's for. It's a maritime domain awareness satellite uh, constellation of three. And nano satellites uh, can be different sizes, but these... (laughs) <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. But but these satellites are about about yay big. So they're probably about oh, okay. a foot and a half, two foot tall. They actually look about the size of a standard PC case. Yeah, and they look like a PC, wow. a PC in space. <laughs> a PC in space, just floating around there, and then yeah. a satellite that yeah. communicates yeah. back back with us. Because because we saw that um, uh, the oh. Aeros South Africa has an Aeros in space space yeah. uh, agency. <laughs> believe it or not. And they, they were given quite a substantial budget at 1.3 or 1.5 billion uh, billion rand to develop more satellites. Uh-huh. And I think the general public looked at this and went, oh, really? <laughs> South Africa has that well, capacity. Well, South Africa Where's within four, four years is going to launch its own satellites from the Karoo, please. That's that's what they're saying now. They're high. By the way, uh, we, we, Rob, Wolf K did just provide us with an update on the information. Uh, he says that those nano satellites are going to be used to do land surveys for land expropriations. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> land surveys are yeah. brilliant. I just sent I like you that. on WhatsApp uh, two images of what those nano satellites look like. So if you want to take a quick peek there. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. They look like something straight out of, out of Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah, well, and Ar- Arctic says, but the tender said they were full size satellites. <laughs> 27 million Rand, by the way, is what this project cost. And they 27 were, million. And they were built in South Africa. 
Wow. Why? Well, achievement. Well, well done to whoever did that. It's, it's yeah. a well, landmark moment. Next thing, man on the moon. Well, Here we come. Well, South Africans can't read and write, but they can launch satellites. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's brilliant. Let's, let's hope to see more of that. It'd be a great, a great achievement for South Africa to actually get back on the, on, on the map through some um, special development or, yeah, we, we were so fantastic. And first, first heart in, transplant, in the 70s Christian 80s. Bernard yeah. in the 60s. First, first exactly. heart transplant. Yep. Yeah. And there were many, many other achievements. Well, the G five, the G six. You know, anti mine personnel vehicles, medical advances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, South Africa. There's two countries in the world that have a medical intelligence organization: United States, yeah. USAMRID, and South Africa. You have medical intelligence. The only two countries wow. in the world do that for your military forces. Pretty cool. Wow, I didn't. I yeah. didn't even know that. What yeah. what exactly is that? Well, what, what no, they, to, no, before what, we get there, I just have to say there's there, there's a great oxymoron that that gets thrown around quite often. Yeah, government intelligence. Uh, yeah. Does it? Well, <laughs> well, yeah. trust me, as a military intelligence officer, I get all the military intelligence. Uh, you know, get that all the time. <laughs> no, no, South Africa has. Uh, I don't know the current state of it. I haven't been following it. But when I used to be an intelligence analyst uh, dealing with it, uh, I covered it, and they were one of the few countries. The reason they did it is because you had troops from SADAF deploying all over the place. You know, back, I don't know when it was formed. I think it was formed in the 50s or 60s, but but uh, it was necessary to deal with um, malaria and to deal with tropical diseases. They had to research and follow up and track where it's at and that sort of thing. So, But it was it was an arm of the military uh, in the South African Defense Forces, and it stayed there after 94. So I don't know the current state, if it still exists. Maybe it could have gone the way of the scorpions, you know, been replaced by something like the chicken hawks. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's one of only two countries in the world that had a military intelligence, uh, medical intelligence. And ours is USAMR, United States uh, uh, Military, what is it, Army Mili Infectious Disease Research Center, whatever. That's at Fort Detrick, Maryland. That's one of the places where we have the level, um, we have the, the, the hot zones, the level, of, um, was it level three, level wow. four, biohazard labs where you can take dangerous things like Ebola and bring them out in the lab. Um, if you ever watch <laughs> that movie Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman, that's that was supposed yes. to be USAMRID. That's where they're at. <laughs> oh, okay, brilliant. Yeah. So brilliant. where, so where Kevin, Spa Kevin Spacey got infected would have been in the lab at USAMRID at Fort Dietrich, which, by the way, is one hour from my house. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? But <laughs> you, you'll be the epicenter of any outbreak there from, from the lab. Why is my skin <laughs> melting? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like living next door to a nuclear power plant. But anyway, uh, maybe I should have paid more attention. Actually, I live to next door to a nuclear power plant. Three Mile Island is only 30 kilometers away. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but it's de it's decommissioned now. This year it was decommissioned. Wow, really? That's yep. Yep. why. What? Why? You see, here, um, here we go again yeah. on decommissioning nuclear power plants yeah. to pay to make way for well, uh, no, wind and in, solar. In, in this case, no. it had less to do with that and more to do with the fact that it's ancient and um, yeah. the technology mm -hmm. is dated and and maintenance and keeping it up is a challenge. It becomes more costly at some point. The reality is that uh, instead of embracing nuclear power, which is what we should have done. And the good news is the nuclear industry hasn't sat still. They may have been banned from building new plants for decades and have a hard time getting through regulatory hoops, but the mm -hmm. nuclear industry in, in France, in the United States, and Japan has advanced, advanced, advanced. Now we have these micro reactors. They're very small yeah. that can power an entire town. Uh, even if they blew up, if someone attacked them, the, the amount of radiation is, 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 is minimal. It's, it's almost non-existent. They use far less plutonium and, uh, and, and other, other radioactive materials in order to make it work. Um, they're very effective. So they make these microgrids with micro nuclear reactors and securing them is, is a lot easier. You can disable them so that someone tries to you know, break in and steal the physical material and that sort of thing. Anyway, it's, 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 it's really a fascinating field. And um, I've done a lot of work and research in that area, and it's 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 a shame that we don't adopt it because South Africa has the technology, has the capability of doing this right now, and you could deliver all the electricity South Africa needs and not need to use your coal. You could send it all to China, let them pollute the earth and make money off of them, mm -hmm. and uh, you wouldn't have to worry about unreliable solar photovoltaic cells that have to be replaced every five years because the Chinese make inferior products. <laughs> they definitely do, yeah. I think that that's definitely the way to go, is is those uh, microgrids, microgrid yeah. solutions, and. Definitely those, uh, what do they call them, small to medium, uh, small modular reactors or whatever. Yeah, that's what, yeah, small modular reactors. Yeah, exactly. That's what you're talking about. Yep, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, look, look, the Kuberg facility is, is past its, 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 its sell-by date. I mean, that's that's that thing is, uh, it's going to cost a fortune to upgrade it and or just maintain it and go forward. And they don't really have any plans uh, in the works. And it's a shame because we wasted so much energy with Jacob Zuma's corrupt regime trying to buy Russian nuclear power plants from Ross Adam. They should have mm -hmm. simply been selling 
the uh, the South African uh, reactors, which are quite effective. Uh, Marilyn Bergeshaw just pointed out that the creepy crawly pool cleaner was also a South African invention. Yeah, that's true. But my, yes, my, my never worked in Botswana. I hated that damn thing. It broke all the time. I spent more money on that. <laughs> Than I did on my annual subscriptions for magazines. I hate swimming pools. They're such a waste of money and time. Getting that pH balance, keeping that mold out of there. Oh, God, what a pain. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and it, nearly every se second household in South Africa has one. It's I hate quite, them. quite bizarre. I hate them. <laughs> to me, the only no, purpose of that is for a fire pool. <laughs> a fire pool. <laughs> there we go. Oh, the creepy crawler was actually a great South African event. Oh, it is. It's to, brilliant. Yeah. I have to admit, yeah. Very, very good. Such a simple thing. But I think. Most of South African inventions were born out of necessity, yeah, because of the the restrictions and the uh, what sanctions that were placed placed on South Africa. Sasol is a great example of that. Well, yeah, that yeah, the, the trope, the trope uh, fisher, yeah. yeah, the trope fisher uh, yeah. liquefaction of of, petro of of coal. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Yeah, Sasol, yeah. and then it grew from that to be an entire chemicals regime. They really came with a lot of stuff. You know, you're right. Um, all of these things were. Uh, uh, born out necessity, but I mean that's that's kind of the way things are in a lot of cases. Most most inventions we have in America are, are were a consequence of necessity, but in the case of South Africa, it was it was a live or die necessity. And whereas in America, oftentimes it's a, it's a nice to have and be great to advance. You know, the cotton gin would be great if we have the cotton gin, we can have more cotton. But of course, having a cotton gin meant that you needed more slaves to pick the cotton, so it extended <laughs> the institution of slavery, unfortunately. But it did industrialize cotton production. But I mean, there was a downside. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> cotton's almost a, a a bad word. Yeah, we can't even say that. Yeah, we can't well, even pick cotton. it's it's interesting because you know people associate the United States with cotton, but we're nowhere near the world's largest cotton producer, not even remotely. The number one cotton producer in the world, ta -da, China, and Brazil. Those are the yeah. top two cotton producers in the world. We're we are way behind them. And by the way, speaking of production of commodities, uh, a lot of South Africans seem to think South Africa is a major gold producer. You are not. South Africa now comes mm -hmm. in between 8 and 10 on annual gold production statistics. The world's largest gold producer, China. And not from mines they own elsewhere, but inside China. Quality quickly by the wow. U.S., or Canada, U.S., and Australia, mm -hmm. I think, and in in Russia. That order goes back and forth depending on mm -hmm. what level of production is done each year. But South Africa is way down there. The, the gold is so deep, so costly to get to, and with, mm -hmm. and with COVID, it hasn't helped either. Plus, with the intrusion of the government into the mining sector, demanding yes. equity stakes and, and, you know, all this stuff, you find a lot of BEE companies that don't do the exploration. They just get the assets because they're handed to them or sold for a song, and then they do nothing with it. So the gold mining industry, in many respects, has been stagnating in South Africa. Now, it might be because the gold has played out, but I don't think that's the case. I think there's still plenty of gold. Mm -hmm. It's just hard to get at. Definitely. I think it's what, what's a major contributing factor towards uh, the cost of mining in South Africa is obviously electricity. Yeah. And We've, we've seen the closure of many smelting facilities as well because they all they all use a, an extraordinary amount of, of electricity and it's just become too 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 expensive for them to run although some of the big um smelters do have a special uh, contract with with escom the the main electricity supplier where they get it below what escom actually pays for electricity and those are long long-standing contracts that, that are in place so that's also a, a major problem here but uh, as far as electricity goes in, in South Africa, I, I think we're in for a really interesting time as well. Um, I think you're right. <laughs> how long will it last? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. Some people might be saying, well, why would they sell the electricity below cost? No, it's not an ANC thing. It's an electric generation thing. Let me explain why. You have to have a consistent demand on a power grid. If you fluctuate significantly, you do damage to the transmission lines, you do damage to the generation stations, and you also cause all sorts of problems in the grid. You get power surges. So you want to have a consistent. It's nice if you have like 80% draw all the time or 85% draw. But if you go from 90 to 50, and overnight we lose a lot less a lot less power drawn, and that has but but power stations adjust for that. Know how to do that? But if you have that happening at other different times, you have you have lots of problems, and so that's one reason why they would do it. So there'd be consistent demand on the network on the grid to pull so much power from it, and that would be why these companies get sweetheart deals and sometimes below cost. And of course, power generators know that costs fluctuate. It may be below cost today, but if you're more efficient and you're selling more, uh, or it becomes cheaper energy source, then it could be profitable later on. So you know, it's it, there's reasons for it. It may sound like a bad business decision, and it might be. It might be. It might be an ANC business decision, which then, by definition, is a bad business decision. Or it might just be because of the, the vagaries <laughs> of the network. So you know, it's just I thought I'd share that with people because it's important to understand that with power generation. Yep. 
Exactly. Yeah. It's not just a simple on off on off switch as, as most people. No, you just you turn is. you go flip that yes. light switch. Isn't it nice? It's there. Well, there's a lot that goes yes. into making that electricity appear there. An awful lot. <laughs> that reminds that reminds me of a stand up stand up skit by <clears throat> Dara O'Brien, a uh -huh. British guy, <laughs> fantastic intelligent guy, and he says, "Where does everything come from? Oh, it comes from the wall. Electricity comes from the wall." Where, where, where does, where does the toilet flush when I go, oh, uh, goes through the wall? Everything goes through the wall because that's how we, how we perceive. It. We don't think beyond the walls, so perhaps we need to start thinking behind the walls to understand the bigger picture that that's going on here. Well, it, it reminds, yeah. it reminds me of an ANC <laughs> member of Parliament says we don't need farmers, we don't need white farmers. We get our groceries at Shoprite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Oh, that was terrible. But there, it does show you that. The, the average thinking or of the person who's out of touch with reality or, or out of touch with what's actually happening in the world. You know, that, and that, I think, maybe ESCOM is as well. They, they've just recently asked for a 20% increase in tariffs. Yeah, this is a top of 15% last year and 12% yep. year before. It's just, it never ends. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, I get it, but I think a more important piece of this would be to actually get people who are stealing electricity or using it and not paying for it to contribute. Uh, now, a lot of people get upset about the municipalities. They owe so much money. But if you look at what they owe out of the $400 billion debt that ESCOM has, the municipalities owe something like $45 billion. So, I mean, it's like 10%. It matters, but it's not the reason ESCOM is in the crap it's in. It's in the crap it's in because of overpaying for services and under-collecting uh, fees and, and so on and so forth. Mismanagement, uh, stolen funds, the list is endless. But, hey, let me ask you this question um, away from that for a second. Linda Sususlu. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going on there? You heard my thoughts on why she wrote this op-ed. Uh, she's writing this, and we've just had the 110th anniversary of the ANC, which uh, minus 28 years was, in many respects, an admirable organization focused on liberating and getting equality for South Africans, committed to the Freedom Charter of 1955, written almost entirely by South African Jews, by the way, not by uh, mm. black Africans, but <laughs> which is lost on yeah. people. But uh, not that it matters, but I'm just making that point. But, yeah, um, yeah so, um, you know, f since for the last 28 years – a, a poor representation of what the organization was. But what are your thoughts uh, on why Linda Way Sisuzlu penned this op-ed piece? What's she up to? That's a great question. I really have no idea what, what she's up to. She Oh, she's great. Gonna, I thought I was going to get an insightful answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't chatted to her lately. She, oh, okay. she does, she, she's ignoring my calls for some, <laughs> for some reason. No, no. She, she seems to <clears throat> disappear and then resurface when – Whenever things get quiet, or whenever she she needs more attention, <laughs> oh. or she wants to drive, or she wants to drive some some uh, political political game that's going on there. So I think we should perhaps expect something to be to come out of the woodwork. Some some political game is happening in the background in the factions of of the ANC. But why why she would write such an such an op-ed is is really uh, beyond me. I, I cannot figure that one out. I think she's definitely just scoring or trying to score score favorable points somewhere. Perhaps, perhaps there's talk of uh, reshuffling people around. Who knows? And maybe mm. maybe she's yeah. a target maybe. and she's trying to she's trying to short circuit it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And she's I don't know. She's oh I, don't, I try not to pay too much attention to her, and I don't think anybody else does. So maybe maybe that is that is part of it. I don't think there's any anything sinister or too sinister behind it. I think she's just feeling kind of left out in what in what's going on. <laughs> oh, that's that's a fair statement. Uh, for me, I think that uh, she's just testing the waters and seeing if if she's yeah. still got some pull or she's got any influence, which I don't think she has. Uh, as yeah. I said, the only reason she's been a member, a minister of parliament in parliament as long as she has been a member is because of mommy and daddy. You know, exactly. uh, her parents, exactly. ta yeah. their towering liberation credentials, which are legitimate for both of them, yeah. Albertina and Walter. And, and she's always been, you know, she's always been that the, the kind of person that does seek the limelight. She's more, she's more of a socialite than, than, yeah. than a politician. She's the Kim Kardashian yeah. in South African politics. <laughs> she is. She is. Without a doubt. <laughs> well, I mean, she dresses and, the pot too. Yeah, and a lot of people think she's easy on the eyes. She's sixty-seven, and you know, she's not a bad-looking lady for sixty-seven. I'll give her that. But uh, you know, not that sixty-seven-year-old ladies are not attractive. I'm just saying. <laughs> Wait, I'm digging. <laughs> that hole's getting deep, man. I'm sick of down here. It is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <It> is. <laughs> My mom, to, my mom just switched off. Damn it, mom, come back. <laughs> there goes the septuagenarian uh, demographic. <laughs> no. 
Now, a couple of people asked questions about this. I saw reports on this earlier, and uh, Roy, who's in the States, made a comment. I don't think, uh, I don't know if he's responding to it or he just mentioned it. Roy said something like, you know, you, you get pulled over 22 kgs of uh, marijuana. I, I, I was just taking this to the police station. I found it. That's a good defense. But uh, but uh, the reason this came up, I think, is because I guess the, the so-called Khoisan King, who's been at the parliament for going on three years now, uh, apparently got uh, busted for growing weed in Daga at, at the parliament building. <laughs> What's going on there, man? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good for him. Good for him. Why not? <clears throat> it's part part of his heritage. It's part of South Africa's heritage, and who knows? The there is talk. Well, it has been it has been sort of semi legalized in South Africa already. Um, it's tolerated. <laughs> it's tolerated. Yeah. yeah. But uh, no, actually, it has, there, there has been a cannabis bill that that, oh, okay. that was that was passed. Yeah. And you can you can have a certain amount on you. Um, you can grow a certain number of plants. I think you can have eleven plants or so, uh, but you can't purchase it or sell it. Mm. So you can you can grow it, you can possess it, and 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 you can smoke it and do whatever you want. Um, but why he decided to grow it out a, a whole giant? It wasn't a small tree or a bush either. No, I saw the photos. It's taller than he tree. is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, maybe maybe he was just trying to prove a point there. He's been there a while. So. Yeah, it's over <laughs> two years. It it's in his third yeah. year now. Uh, you know, people yeah. asked me to get him on as a guest, and um, I said I don't have any contact. When someone gave me his contact information, and, uh, and I wrote to him on WhatsApp, and he read the message, and then uh, he's probably busy growing his weed because he never got back with me. <laughs> <laughs> or he smoked it, one of the two. But <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so he's just trying to make it more homely. You know, trying to show Parliament how it's done. When people <laughs> zoll, when people zoll, they put the saliva on the paper. And when people <laughs> zoll, <laughs> they share that zoll. God. <laughs> I wonder if you do it. Do you, do you observe COVID regulations when you, when you pass? When you nah, have, man. Have pass? Nah, it? man. It's just cool. It's all cool, man. Here you go. You want a doobie? There you go. Hey, hang on. Let me get let me get my roach, man. Let me get my roach clip. <laughs> License and registration. It's on the back of the car, uh, man. It's on the back of the car. Ah, uh, here we go. Cheech and Chong. Yeah, that's I right. Like that. That's like right. That. Hey, what's in this, yeah. man? Well, it's mostly Maui Waui, but it's got some Labrador in it. <laughs> Labrador? What's Labrador, man? Oh, my dog ate my stash. He had to follow him around the baggie for three days. He's smoking dog shit, man. Cool. <laughs> Tommy Chong, the son of a Chinese Canadian immigrant and an Anglo Saxon woman from uh, British Columbia, if I'm not mistaken, born in the 1930s in that systemically racist <laughs> country of Canada. Systemically racist. <laughs> Mixed race in the 1930s, half Chinese, half Anglo Saxon. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Mm, mm. Very interesting indeed. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, Ruth, Ruth says it's going to change our economics. Green gold. Yeah, that's what Colorado said. And they've just got lots of criminal problems now. So, and not much tax revenue, they claim. But uh, tell you what, there's a pot dispensary on every block. I was out there, Colorado Springs in August, man. There were more pot locations than McDonald's. You know, something's going on when you see that. <laughs> <laughs> they're normally right next, to, next door to each other, aren't they? You smoke there and you get the munchies and you. To go for a burger there, but no, <laughs> you know, there's legalizing it in in South Africa. There's been a lot of talk around around that and actually developing a, a proper industry around it. And the uh, benefit to government is obviously the taxes that that will follow. <laughs> but well, see, that's the problem in South Africa. I don't want more revenue to be accrued to the ANC. I want less. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I can guarantee you, the licenses that will be dished out for for the growers and for the producers. There will only be about five that will be dished out. We'll be dished out to connected, connected exactly. cronies, and and so on. And government will have a stake in them, like they have a stake in well, nearly everything, everything else. Yeah, the yep. telcos, mobile telcos. It'll be exactly the same thing. And well, oh, well I yeah, know no, it's a good thing or a bad thing. Hey? Ruth is saying, <laughs> what is what's the military view on cannabis? U.S. military is it's it's a criminal substance. If you test positive for it, you'll be sanctioned and processed for non-judicial punishment. You can be given a dishonorable discharge. So normally, if you test positive and you're now so you're enlisted, they'll <laughs> simply separate you with an uh, an other than honorable or an honorable discharge and administrative process. But you can 
be confined. You can pay a fine. You you can have a criminal record. Uh, it's a com- it's a criminal conviction, and military criminal convictions carry over. They're, they're not they're not not part of society. They carry. And oh, by the way, if you're in the military and you get arrested for marijuana by a civilian law enforcement officer, you could be prosecuted and convicted by civilian courts, and then the military gets their turn. It's not double jeopardy. It's not double jeopardy. Unlike, you know, I can't be prosecuted for the same crime by civil authorities twice, but I can be prosecuted by the military and the civil authorities and convicted and serve time for both for the same offense. It's a very useful measure to keep people from molesting their children, although it's not foolproof, and from murdering others because <laughs> we have a federal death penalty. The state you're in may not have a death penalty. Guess what? If you commit an estate and the military has a say, you will get the death penalty and we'll put you on death row. Uh, but as far as marijuana, uh, it's a criminal. You can be busted for it. And it is illegal on a federal institution. So in Colorado, it's legal. And as you drive in every military installation there, there's a big sign. Marijuana, before you get to the gate, basically turn around. I don't care if you're civilian, because if you enter a military installation, that is consent to be stopped and searched. You don't have a choice in the matter. If you are pulled over, whether you're military, civilian, or a foreign national, unless you're diplomat, different story, but you have consented to a search by entering the installations, federal property. And that's the same on all federal property, whether it's the Capitol building or it's, you know, it's the White House, you've consented to a search for public safety. And so the big sign says marijuana is an illegal, maybe legal in Colorado, but not on federal installations. So basically turn around and get out of Dodge. And if you don't and you get pulled over, you can be arrested. Now, prosecuting a civilian who comes on an installation, um, it's up to the, um, the, the, um, no, it's not the attorney general, but the uh, f- federal, whatever they call it, the federal, prosec- federal prosecutor for that area. They can prosecute you. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But what, at a minimum, what will happen is you'll be banned from the military installation. So if you're like a contractor that delivers foods or services, like, you won't be able to go back there. So it's just not something to mess around with. Um, the military frowns on it with good reason. Just think about this. Do you want your military police on duty? <laughs> oh, oh, man, I think there's speed. Let's chase them. You know, do you want a soldier going to the motor pool to fire up that M1 Abrams tank with 120 millimeter round? No. Is is that a is that a is that a blank round or a live saber round? <laughs> oh, it was live, man! Look, it blew up the BMW. How cool is that? You know, or, or you know, better yet, uh, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, please buckle in. <laughs> Flight 27 is taking off for Peterson Air Force Base right now. You know, you can't have yeah. people on intoxicating substances. It's the same thing yeah. with alcohol. Now, the yeah. argument that Ruth's probably going to make or someone's going to say, yeah, but Chris, you're allowed alcohol. Why can't you have pot? Well, there are reasons for it. And we're not going to go into that because I've stated my position on marijuana. I oppose it. I don't think there's any mm-hmm. utility in it. A lot of my viewers mm-hmm. disagree. And that's your prerogative. Um Right now, it's illegal for federal employees and federal installations, and that's how it's going to stay. And even with the Manchurian cadaver in office, we haven't even tried to go down that path. So we'll see what happens. But it's, it's look, I mean, you can't have people drunk and driving tanks or flying planes, and you can't have them high on weed. Um, it's just not a healthy thing. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. And I suppose it's even worse in the military because you, know, you, you have to react at any given moment. Exactly. So, there's no real recreation time at, at all. There's no set time or off time. You, you're always on standby for something. And if you slightly inebriated in, or intoxicated, then, yeah, it's going to definitely affect your performance or your ability or, or more than likely your willingness to, to, to perform in the case of, of, of marijuana. Yeah. I mean, and ducker, ducker, as it's called. Yeah, yeah. ducker. Yeah, there. Yeah. But... Um, you know, and people make mistakes. Even highly trained, experienced people make mistakes in the heat of the moment. Look at Kim Potter, now convicted of double mm-hmm. double manslaughter or whatever, and she's in prison. I don't know if she's out yet, but she's a cop with 27 years, 26 years of service, and she reached for what she thought was her taser on her left side and grabbed her service revolver and fired a shot, fired a warning shot, and, mm-hmm. and killed this guy. I mean, can you imagine if, if she had a beer before she went on shift or if she smoked a joint before she went on shift and her judgment? I mean, th- this would be more, far more common. People, air traffic controllers, pilots, bus drivers, combi drivers, taxi drivers, train conductors, military police, law enforcement, soldiers, sailors, marines, coast guardsmen, these people, doctors, 
EMTs, they must be lucid and have clear thinking at all times. They must make split second, literally split second decisions. If you don't think about split second decisions, watch the video I put up a while ago of the Los Angeles Police Department where their plane crashed on the train tracks in Los Angeles and a train is coming towards the station. The LAPD frantically get this guy out of the carcass of his plane and drag him to safety less than three seconds before a train obliterates his plane. You can't have cops going, man, I think he's stuck, man. Dude, can you get him out of there? I don't know, man. Let's see, I got let's the, see what happened. I got the munchies, man. Hang on a second. We'll take care of it after we have this. Let me get him out of that doobie, man. Hey, no, no. I want my roach, man. I don't want your Rona. Let me use my roach. You can't have that nonsense, man. You can't have that nonsense. You know, And pe people lose sight of that. They lose sight of that. Look, when you, when you do things in service to society, you surrender some of your liberties and freedoms. And one of the ones I surrendered as serving as a commission officer is that I couldn't speak ill of my chain of command. We can't have commission officers running around, colonels going, oh, the president's a dipshit. He is, but I can't be saying that. That reduces confidence in the neutrality of our military and its subservience to civil authority, which is above it. You can't be doing that. You can't have you know, generals running around and, you know, like like we saw with um, during the Clinton administration. We saw during the Bush administration. We saw during the Obama administration. Flag officers publicly refuting the commander in chief. You can't have that. Now, that doesn't mean you're a lackey and you just do things that are illegal. No, if it's illegal, you're, hey, dude, I'm done. Game over. I'm not going to break the law. Uh, but you, but you but you can't be going. Well, listen, you know, uh, like uh, General Flynn. The reason why, by the way, in case people don't know, why they went after General Flynn, why it became a target, is because he embarrassed. Barack Hussein Obama. When he was director of the director of the national of uh, the, the Defense Intelligence Agency, Obama lied about intelligence. And he was publicly exposed when Michael Flynn, who had issues with, with the president, publicly reported something to the contrary based on actual intelligence. And basically all but said Obama's a liar. You know, he's not telling the truth. This is what really happened. I mean, that's the gist of it. And the Obama administration, of course, he, that was the end of his military career. He didn't do anything after that as a three-star general. He moved on. But um, they never forgot. They never forgot. They never forgave. And the reason they went after General Flynn, the moment he was foolish enough to get involved with the Trump administration, because he should have realized he was going to be a target. They went after him. They violated the Constitution. They, they listened in on his conversations. They distorted what he was doing. They lied about his legal activities, claiming that as the incoming uh, national security advisor, he had no right to talk to foreign officials. Well, of course he did. You don't just like, okay, well, the election was in November. Let's wait till January 23rd. Oh, we're in charge now. So what were you guys doing yesterday with the last administration? We'd like to find <laughs> out. I mean, that's asinine. There's a transition. We have an authorized transition period in which certain activities take place. And among those activities are those in the incoming administration who've been nominated for positions to deal with their counterparts, but they conveniently forgot that. Of course, when Trump left office, the whining from November until January was, hey, Trump's trying to retire the election. We can't do the transition. We can't talk to foreign officials. Wait a second. I thought that was treason talking to foreign officials. You can't do that. Yes, we can. We're Democrats. Okay, fine. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Rules for thee, but not for me. That seems to be the normal in, in, in politics. But I'm, there, I'm, there's good reasons, good yeah. reasons that there's uh, st uh, strict policies and procedures in place. It's to, because it's, they're tried and tested policies and that, that's how they work. Um, but there's an interesting thing there that uh, you say we, should, we shouldn't break the law or um, you, you, can't, you can't break the law. But should you break the law in, in case of, cases of um, sort of irrational and, in, and unjust laws? Oh, and immoral laws. Immoral laws, yeah. Like, how like, do you like, if like. Immoral? Well, see, that's the thing. That's the danger of taking mm -hmm. law into your own hands. I mean, we can make an argument today, which is a fair and reasonable and, and probably accurate argument, say that it was appropriate for people to burn their pass books rather than consent yeah. to the pass laws in South Africa because it was inhumane, it was racist, it was illegitimate, and it was inhumane. I said right. inhumane, it was unfair. Yeah. That's what I'm going to say. Uh, we can make that argument, but it was the law. It was legal. Apartheid was legal. It was a system that passed by a government. Yeah. So, so it is, but it's a slippery slope. You got to be careful, right? I mean, people can say that mandatory jabs are unlawful, they're immoral, and yeah. not to get them. But you face the full weight of the power of the state, which has a monopoly on force, if you do that. So either you better be in a, in a, in a large minority or, or a majority or have the willingness to sacrifice an awful lot. And some people do. Some people are willing to sacrifice their lives and die for what they think is a just cause. And... Whether you like what they do or don't like what you do, you, you've got to in some way respect that. I mean, Bobby Sands starved to death. 
He was a terrorist mm. with the Irish Republican Army, and he starved to death rather than take food in a prison because he felt he was unjustly imprisoned by UK authorities. Now, I think Bobby Sands was a terrorist and probably belonged in prison, but um, I didn't like the guy, but I kind of respect that it, I mean, he went all the way. I think it's crazy. I don't think it served any purpose, mm. although we know who Bobby Sands is today. Had it not been for him, you know, hunger strike, we probably never would have heard of Bobby Sands, just another terrorist from the IRA in prison. So you know, he got elected to the parliament while he was in prison, so, you know, representing... Um, Northern Ireland, yes. but yeah, it's uh, it's 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 a tough one. It's a good question there, Rob. I mean, that's a good um, philosophical question about which laws. Mm -hmm. So, but if the law is clearly there, if you haven't contested the law with every legal legitimate means at your disposal, then I kind of take exception to people simply disregarding the law. So, like for instance, yeah. well, I think it's unfair that they make us go fifty-five miles per hour. You know, a hundred kilometers. That's just that's not even hundred. It's ninety kilometers. That's not right. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. drive one forty. Okay, look, I agree with you. I drive 140 when it's allowed in Germany, but it is the law and we need to change the law and let's take an effort to change the law before you just start driving at 140 miles an hour and killing people because everybody else is going 55. <laughs> you know? Right. So, <laughs> so, so if, it, 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 if it was, uh, in, in my mind, if, if the majority of a population in, in, a, in a country uh, says, okay, no, we, we not, we're just going to disregard this law, and we can look at the, the passbook law and, and, and apartheid for that. Does that law only become unjust and unjust law when the majority feels that it no. is an unjust law? No, no, it doesn't. Broad-based mm. black economic empowerment is a racist piece of legislation which is unjust uh -huh. and immoral, and it affects a minority, the South Africans. Mm. So, no, it's not just the majority. It's, it's the nature right. of the law or the regulation itself. The lockdown okay. was immoral, yeah. unjust, and illegal and unconstitutional in my mind. The South African authorities have abused their power for the state of disaster, which is supposed to be discontinued after 90 days. And they've continued it now for 26, 27 months. In my view, immorally, certainly, unconstitutionally in my view. I'm not a constitutional scholar. I think that maybe Mark Oppenheimer might view it differently. He does know what he's talking about when it comes to that. But my view is that this is simply a political ploy from people that either are doing it intentionally or are completely ignorant of what's actually happening around them. And either case is a disaster for South Africa. So no, it's not just a majority. It can be a minority. Yeah. You know, it, 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 a law can be unjust and immoral when it affects a minority. In fact, it's even worse, in my view, when a law is passed that affects a minority because then it's the tyranny mm -hmm. of the majority against a weak minority that can't defend itself. And that's exactly what we see that's here. You, you know, could you imagine if South Africa was 90% white and 10% black and that law was written for the benefit of white people against black people? People would be up in arms. Oh, wait a second, they were. It was apartheid, except it was a minority against my... But, you know, yeah, <laughs> exactly. and, and it was Jim Crow in America discriminating against black Americans. People were up in arms about it because it's immoral. Yes. And what, what irritates me and fascinates me is that people will justify these crimes or these immoral laws based on righting historical wrongs, uh, unless it affected you directly. And I don't want to hear, well, I'm poor because my ancestors had their land stolen 400 years ago. Get over it. You could have stole some more land on your own in the last four, four centuries, you know? You know, it's ridiculous yeah. to to this historical dispensation. Like in, in, in Linda Way Sousa, she's talking about, you know, re redistribution yes. of wealth. Um, now, she's using the argument of historical context, but she's doing it from her socialist mindset. You know, it's ludicrous. Redistribution of wealth is immoral. Take, unless someone exactly. achieved the wealth by an illegitimate means, that's not that's not redistribution. That's restitution, and that's legitimate. Yes. But if, if someone earned... I, I love the... Yeah, okay. I love the fact that, that she's, she's talking about redistribution of wealth. Well, like, you will lead by example then, Linda. Right? Exactly. Show us how it's done. Yeah. You are worth a crap load. Let's see you redistribute your wealth first. No, 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 no. It's not about a redistribution of her wealth. It's redistribution of other other people's wealth. And that, that's the problem with, with people like her that put out these ridiculous op-eds. They always talk about other people's wealth. And they, they seem to remove themselves from, from the discussion quite conveniently. And they do that by standing on the podium and pointing fingers at, at, at others. Well, I mean, you see Bernie Sanders. He owns four houses, including a vacation home <laughs> yes, on a lake. Yes, yes. But he's a died to world communist, and, and the government has been taking for the people. Oh, these Republicans yes. are evil. Uh, dude, I, I don't have that kind of wealth. I've worked for that, 40 that's, years. That's why he changed the, his whole story from uh, tax, tax, the, tax the millionaires to... Tax the billionaires. Pointers. But 
you're a millionaire. Oh, no, tax the billionaires. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's not just there. The the founders of Black Lives Matter, one of the, the women who is the founder of Black Lives Matter, um, who claimed, you know, that she's destitute and poor. She owns like four houses and she's been flipping houses and she's and, and they, they've been they're grifters who've taken all these donations and this this blackmail they're shaking down corporations for who want to look like they're they're woke and just um and and, and they're just they're just thieves they're grifters and and this is, this is nancy pelosi gets a sweetheart deal on shares from visa corporation when legislation yes. is running its way through the house of representatives in 2008 which would have cost visa billions of dollars in fees which would have been taxes to the government and she ensured <laughs> that that bill didn't pass wow no is, light of day thrown on that that's insider trading 100 percent, and she knows that why hasn't she been arrested where's the fbi well because, well the fbi is too busy chasing down you know domestic terrorists also identified as parents of school children you know there you go <laughs> <laughs> They're dressing in their blue and khaki yes oh, my gosh <laughs> but you know i oh. rob it's it's all the fault of the white patriarchy that's what's behind all this misery of the world Never mind the fact that um, the uh, the Western developed world has been overly generous with its resources, but but they created an economic system that oppressed. Oh, stop, 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 stop. The rules are the same for everyone. You have a chance. It's not America's fault that uh, Mozambique is a disaster. You might blame Portugal for the conditions that got it off to a poor start, but you can't blame Portugal in 2021. Uh, Portugal has done a lot to help Mozambique since 1992 when the Civil War ended, and Mozambique has not gone very far. Now, they did progress by leaps and bounds, and for years the left's like, oh, look at this, Mozambique has got like 20%, 15% GDP. Yeah, from nothing. They produced, their economy was completely destroyed. You know, if you gave me a $1 million economy and a country of 16 million people, I could turn into a $1 billion economy in five years, and then a $2 billion. Eventually, you run out of steam because you reach a certain, you know, threshold. But anyway, it just it gets it gets obnoxious. I mean, look at South Africa. Last year in July, the um, the African Development Bank gave South Africa two hundred eighty five million dollar loan. In August, the new development bank or the BRICS Bank, which South Africa is a member of, gave them one billion dollars. And then, funny, the new BRICS Bank is is something formed by the Chinese, but they do dollar denominations for their loans. But anyway, $1 billion. And then the IMF gave South Africa $4.3 billion. That's $5.6 billion at the then exchange rate that was about 90 billion rand. Where's where's that money? It was for COVID relief. Where's that money? Yes, exactly. Where's that COVID COVID refund? Five hundred billion disappeared. Absolutely disappeared. Did it ever materialize though? That's that's well, I, I don't. I don't. What I don't know. Is, what I don't know is if that ninety billion was part of that five hundred million they're talking about. Mm-hmm. I don't. You don't know, or billion, not not million, billion. Yeah, billion. It's uh, it's it's crazy. Um. Anyway, it's just we could go on about that stuff for hours, but uh, it is interesting <laughs> today. South Africa, which has uh, a population in which uh, a fair majority of people who graduate matriculate through high school, and even those who go on to university cannot read and write. <laughs> yes. Uh, but they have three. Shocking. Three nano satellites that are entering orbit around the planet yes. so they can um, yes. i guess spy on new tracks of land for expropriation that's <laughs> funny when he said that <laughs> now it's for maritime domain awareness maritime domain awareness so now we'll know where all of the um with the what's what's the uh, the abalone uh, poachers are, are diving to get the abalone now we'll be able to see it more clearly <laughs> that's a never-ending saga that oh is. that is a mess and you know most of the world doesn't yeah. know anything about it at all uh, and and mm. it's and and the authorities are looking the other way I mean, people see these yeah. abalone poachers out there every day stealing the stuff, and no one arrests them. Very, very seldom. I know. I know them. why. I, I have a theory as to why. Kickbacks. Because no, no. Because oh. every time, every time it's reported in the news, and, and they have to report these these types of things, they place a value on it. Twenty million rands worth of abalone. And it draws more poachers. Money. It draws more poachers. Of course, it does. You should. You should they should stop putting values on. On, on these seizures, especially at abalone poaching and, and drugs even. It's just why they're putting a value on it. It makes it more attractive to criminals. Really, stop it, government. Listen to this. <laughs> you know, it's, abs- it's, it's funny because some very simple solutions solve problems. And I'll tell you one in a second before I do want to mention something here. Clemster uh, said, uh, for some reason, he's mentioning Natasha Mazzone as a Pelosi girl. It's funny because she appeared on Joe Emilio's program. I was looking at asking Natasha Mazzone to come on my program because she seemed to be someone that is, is getting some attention and talk about some of the DA's policies. And then I, I listened to her on Joe Emilio's program. And she, she gushed about Nancy Pelosi. And I'm like, 
you think Nancy Pelosi is a good legislator? That's what I'm thinking to myself. And I kind of lost interest in talking to Tasha Masson. That doesn't mean I won't talk to her, but I mean, I stopped pursuing the matter because I'm like, ah, I mean, if you actually think not, the only reason you think that Nancy Pelosi is impressive is because she says female genitalia. I guarantee it. Exactly. I guarantee exactly. it. Exactly. It has nothing exactly. to do with oh, her competence. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Oh, look, it has the same genitalia as me. It must be great. Yeah. We have a connection. Exactly. You don't have a connection. Oh, yeah. She's a leftist. You're about as connected. She's about as connected as <clears throat> as Nancy Pelosi's eyebrows are to her face. Not oh my God. <laughs> Did you see those things? <laughs> yeah. At some point you just have to accept time, you know? You just have to accept time. My goodness, that's just crazy. But what I was gonna say is that um when the farm invasion started in Zimbabwe, people in the American policy establishment were at a loss or what to do. And after it been going on for a few months, and after I'd made a trip there during 2000 when they were murdering farm workers and commercial farmers, I actually drove through Matabela and I went to Great Zimbabwe down at Masvingo and toured that. I was like the only tourist there that day. There's no one else. <laughs> and then I actually stayed in a hotel called the Flamboyant Hotel in Masvingo. <laughs> the power was out because Zimbabwe couldn't afford to pay because they, they weren't getting uh, oil from the pipeline. The Kuwaitis, which owned the pipeline coming to Mozambique, could shut it down so they, could, they couldn't generate power. So there was a blackout. And I drove through town and I'm looking and I'm like, went over railroad tracks and I looked at a map. I'm like, there's supposed to be a hotel, it's supposed to be here. There's like railroad tracks. And, and so I, I, I said, hang on a second. I was traveling with a colleague. We stopped, we turned the engine off. I said, can you hear there's people over there? It was, I mean, illumination was really low. I mean, it's like 3%, you could see nothing. And I, I, I think there's, okay, so we turn, it looks like it's a trail. Let's take a chance. We pull up and there's like, you can see the hotel. You start to see the outline of it. And I parked the vehicle and some guy comes out with a little, little lantern. He goes, greetings. I said, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking for the Flamboyant Hotel. He goes, oh, you found it. This is it. I'm like, are you open? Are you out of business because of all the stuff? No, no, we're open. It's just, it's the power. Come back on a little bit. So I went in, I checked the hotel anyway. So, but went to Masvingo. Um, so I came back from that trip and then people ask me, so what, sh what, sh what should we do about Zimbabwe? I'm like, it's pretty easy. If you want to stop the farm invasions, just take a C-130 or a commercial flight, fly it there with a couple of pallet loads of dollars and pay off Mugabe. They're just thieves. If you want to stop the farm invasions, you could do it for a billion dollars a year. They'll stop doing it. Yes. That'll be the end of the discussion. Mm -hmm. There'll be no more talk about kith and kin and wagon trains stealing land from black Africans and the unfairness because it isn't about that. It's about their self-aggrandizement, their self-enrichment, and that's what it's all about. They've stolen everything from the rest of the economy, the mining sector, the, the industrial base. They've destroyed it all, and there's nothing left. So they went for the commercial farms. It took them 20 years to steal everything else, and then they went for commercial farms. And I said, if you want to avoid it, all you got to do is take pallet loads of cash. And just pay them a billion dollars a year. Do it off books. Let the CIA do it. And consider it part of our foreign foreign aid. And I guarantee you that this will stop tomorrow. And now people, what about what about what about Hitler and his his? his nah, that guy will disappear. He will and he died mm -hmm. after that. He'll just there'll be the end of that. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing, Rob. Before we end the program, I still have incredulity. I'm incredulous at, ooh, big use of the word there twice. Um, I'm incredulous at the footage from the Financial Times, from the Wall Street Journal, from The Economist, from, from Mail and Guardian. I think, was Mail and Guardian around there? I'm trying to remember. I, I can't remember. But I think they were. But all these different outlets back in 2000 when the farm invasions took place in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwean war vets upset. And I'm looking at the footage. The war ended in 1979, 1980. Blank Strauss Agreement, uh, 1980, we have a new dispensation. So it's 2000, it's been 20 years. In order to be a war veteran of any stripe whatsoever, you would have had to have been at least 14 or 15 years old in 1980, which means you would have had to have been born in the 1960s. How can this be war veterans toy toying outside this white commercial farmer's farm outside Bulawayo when the average person standing there is about 12 to 14 or 15 years old? Even 20-year-olds, you'd have to be in your 30s or 40s to be a war veteran at a minimum. Most were in their 50s and 60s. So to hear this, and, and, and they fell for it. Well, this is, this is they're, they're writing an injustice. No, they're not. They're stealing land that was legally purchased under the Mugabe government. And people were stupid. They fell for it. 42% of all commercial farmland designated by the government itself in 2000, now they've done this since, since 1980, designated commercial farmland by the government had changed hands at least once. It had been sold. And the rule was, by the Lancaster government, first right of refusal. Zimbabwe's government under Prime Minister Mugabe from 80 to 88 and then President Mugabe from 88 to 2017 had the first right of refusal to all land sales. No one could buy it until they said, okay, we pass. So what's the problem? They didn't care. They were only there to steal from. So we could have solved this problem. 
It's an easy solution. Ship a pallet load of dollar bills and just deliver it to Mugabe exactly. and his thugs and Zanu PF, and the problem goes away. Definitely. And I, I think you can do that with any with any African leader. Any any leader in the world, I'm sure, can, can do that. Which is probably why this, this whole COVID thing has been so successful. There's been a serious amount of, of deals that, that have that have been been made, a serious amount of people who've uh, gained financially from it and a serious amount of money that's gone missing so let's let's not let's not uh discount the fact that 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 exact same tactic has has taken place there well i mean the it's, easiest way to 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 overturn the country and get what you want is corrupt the le corrupt the leaders and they are easily corruptible they're only well, human at the end of the day yeah only human i think it's also illustrative of the whole thing that um that when this started before any impact of the corona pandemic had hit, before most countries even had a lockdown, most didn't, before any cases rocked up in Africa, in March, in April of 2020, African Union finance ministers from the different states were screaming for debt relief. They're already demanding debt relief. Uh, excuse me, debt relief what? So you can't make your payments? Your economy hasn't even begun to slow down yet. Now, this wasn't, Rob, based on their projections of where their economy was gonna go which would have been at least, you know, a legitimate effort to try to get it. They were just demanding it because, hey, here's a chance to get debt relief. And what do they get? Debt relief, debt relief, debt relief. We have forgiven some. And then we get, we give loans, which are nonsense. They're grants. They're no interest loans. South Africa got a 1.3% or something like that in, a loan from the IMF. That's not even inflation. The money's worth less when you pay it back than you got it. So that's essentially a grant. I mean, if they pay it back, it won't be a grant, but it's, 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 it's it's a handout is what it is. It's just crazy. Now, uh, I think that Kevin actually sorted this out. I was trying to figure this out, and he, uh, here's the answer. So, Kevin, now, bear in mind that Zimbabwe is a landlocked country. They do have Lake Kariba behind a reservoir, but they don't have a navy, okay? But nonetheless, but but Kevin says the young war veterans back in 2000, 2002 were seamen during the war years. Fair point. <laughs> <laughs> they were all they were all in dad's bag. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> bag dad, dad bag. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. It's just like the the MK vets in in South Africa. Oh God! Wow. Oh, God. <laughs> First of all, what are they veterans of? Where where were they? Yeah. And man, they were young. <laughs> well, and, and also, <laughs> if rebranded themselves as MK vets. A <laughs> hundred thousand members of the Mil Mkonto Wesizwe Military Veterans Association. Um, if there were 100,000 military veterans from MK, the SADAF would have had a far bloodier effort and the police would have dealt with far more bombings and assassinations and communications towers destroyed than they ever dealt with. 100,000, that's just total nonsense. Uh, you know, I, I look at Linda Way Sousa, it says MK veteran. Uh, I don't know what she did during the struggle. Um, I don't know where she was. Was she in Quattro? Did she go in the Bush War? The legitimate number of MK veterans, my estimate over the years, based on what I know, what I've seen behind closed doors and in front of closed doors, is probably about 2,500 to 2,800 legitimate people who could say they're a veteran of the Bush War. And um, there would be more, except that the ANC murdered them at, at Quattro. So they murdered their own people. Uh, so it's 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 the joke. I, I, when I worked in uh, neighboring countries in Africa, without disclosing the art, Botswana, um, uh, members of the security forces would would laugh with me sitting down talking about MK and how they boast about being veterans and like veterans. They lived in a house here in, in, in block four and all they did was party and get drunk and hang around with whores. And then when the South Africans came through and killed them, <laughs> they claimed they were soldiers. They weren't soldiers. Anyway. <laughs> Yikes. Exactly. Now, now, look, there, 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 there are legitimate NK veterans who actually fought in the struggle and actually, not just terrorism, but actually fought in the bush. So I don't mean to denigrate the real veterans. I'm just talking about the fake hangers on. Sorry. Definitely. Definitely. And it's all, all based around government grants and, and social acceptance and so on. There, there's no doubt about that. Exactly. Yes, Chris. Great. It's time. <laughs> it's time. Two hours. All right. Cool beans. Um, uh, I hope you're feeling better. You did pretty well. You held up. I was going to stop this a couple times, but conversation was going good. You looked like your voice was holding out. So um, yeah, it wasn't, yeah, not too bad today. Yeah. Hopefully, it'll be better than fixed up next by next week. Get rid of that. It, it's not Corona. There's no way it is. Yeah, and I wouldn't get tested to find out if it was anyway. Just pad so, their just pad their stats needlessly. They're not going to give you any treatment. Exactly. So why bother? Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, we'll be back next week for answer the question with Rob Hutchison and Chris White. Thanks a lot, Rob. I'm going to wrap up the program. I'll put you in the waiting room. Any last thoughts before we go? I'll give you the stage uh, if you want to share anything with anybody. And then oh, I'll good. Down. All good. I think what's what's emerging from 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 these discussions is is a uh, that. We need to ask more questions, not with just each other, but 
in, in with uh, the public in general. If we want to get down to the truth, as you said right in the beginning of, of this discussion, we need to start questioning more. We need to look at the facts from both sides. We need to start discovering the facts for ourselves, analyzing the data that's presented to us, and not taking everything for face value, whether it's coming from, from our media, whether it's coming from politicians, or even people in supposed places of authority. It's up to us to determine what's the truth and then make decisions based on, on what, we, what we believe to be, to be that truth. Well, I think that's, that's an excellent uh, wrap up there. Thanks a lot, Rob. Appreciate it. Good to see you again. I hope you feel better. And uh, we'll get together next week. Today's the 13th. So that'll be the 20th of January for the next um, Answer the Question with Rob Hutchison and Chris White. Rob, thanks a lot. Uh, I'll let you drop off and then I'll wrap up the show. Okay. Thank you very much. And thanks for everyone for, for listening and hanging in there. Listen yeah. to us rambling away. Two hours and the audience is still here. Must have done something wow. semi-correct. Mm-hmm. <laughs> absolutely absolutely maybe they're waiting for something to happen <laughs> yeah. maybe they're waiting for us to be swatted did somebody call a swat on us oh my gosh oh my gosh that's possible dangerous possible. dangerous thanks, stuff thanks very much for the time again no we worries definitely definitely meet again next week Looking all right forward to it. i'll let you drop off there rob okay All right, folks, that's it for Answer the Question for today, the 13th of January, 2022. Also the day in which uh, SpaceX launched their latest mission, the Transporter 3 mission, which included three nano satellites assembled and built and designed in South Africa. That's not working the order. They were designed, assembled, built, whatever, in that order. Uh, They are now up in space. And uh, there you go, folks. Uh, South Africa has got a constellation of three nano satellites, which provide maritime domain awareness. Uh, So thanks for tuning in with Rob and I. Appreciate your patronage of the channel. Be sure to smash the like button. It costs you nothing but a second of your time. It's right down there below the window. Just push that button and that was easy. There you go. Uh, Thanks a lot. We'll catch you next time here. And I'll have a night owls here a little bit later on Chris White African, about an hour and 30 minutes. We'll see you then. Cheers, everybody. Take care of yourselves and enjoy your day.